Greetings, everyone. Thank, thank everyone for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Mario Prince, Senior Director at CSAC, um, bringing to you a great discussion today with some very, very um, dope, incredible creators um, that we have joining us. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves shortly, but I just want to give a few opening remarks. Um, this panel, well, today's topic will, will focus primarily on the evolution and manifestations of black, mu of black music and feature outstanding songwriters, artists, producers, and, talk, and they're gonna talk about their experiences. Um, CSAC, for, for those who don't know, unaware, CSAC is a PRO, Performer Rights Organization, and it represents thousands of affiliates and more than one million songs on behalf of songwriters, composers, and music publishers. So we're thrilled to have everybody here today. Um, a few ground rules before we get started. Uh, in order to make sure that we have the best dialogue, we like to remind everyone that this is a safe space. This is the only way that we can have an honest conversation. So you will notice that IS is being recorded and will only release parts of this discussion once we have permission from our panelists. Therefore, please do not record on your screens. Um, again, my name is Mario Prince. I'm working out of the LA office at CSAC. Um, I have James Leach, um, Senior VP of Creative. I'll let him say a few more words and then we'll introduce our panelists. What's happening, folks? Good to see everybody. Thank you to the panelists and for all those tuning in, we really appreciate you, really appreciate you. Um, for starters, as Mario said, we're uh, uh, going to kick it off with uh, a history of where black music was and where it is today and where it continues to go and our predictions as to where uh, the next the next uh, manifestations if you will of black music will be um, music's always been rich and an important part of our culture not just solely for entertainment is a way to express ourselves going back to slavery times. Um, it was a way for, for slaves and those people that were uh, in involuntary servitude to express themselves, express times of sorrow, to use coded messaging for educational purposes, for warnings, um, and many of those turned into uh, what we know is, you know, spirituals, Negro spirituals. Some of those songs turned into songs that are used to this very day in martial arts, ranging from uh, those in Indonesia to those in Africa that migrated here to the United States, such as Kicking and Knocking, Capoeira. Those songs are, are still used today and not for the entertainment that you hear when you see these dances performed and these arts performed. They, those songs were specific to uh, warning the villagers about slave masters approaching so they can get to stop from delivering those maya luas and turn those into dance moves, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, the spirituals, many of those were, again, songs that were used to heal and to comfort and to encourage uh, on dark days. And many of those songs have made it through to this day and are still used in the black church today. Um, one of those songs or some of those songs have been turned into compositions. Uh, one of which we're gonna play you today by a composer by the name of Margaret Bonds. She's recognized as being one of the first uh, African-American composers. She was a contemporary of uh, Langston Hughes and collaborated with him quite, quite frequently, especially during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, I'm gonna let Mario, seeing how he's our reg resident DJ as well, on top of young guru over there, <laughs> we're gonna let him spin a little example of uh, one of her renditions of a song called, a composition entitled Troubled Water, which was her variation on, uh, Wade in the water. So Mario, if you'd like to start. Yeah. 
James, I want to I want to allow the panelists to introduce themselves very quickly because oh, we didn't get that. To... We just went straight over the introduction. <laughs> man. I'm so sorry, man. I it's know everybody, called... so I'm like, you know, it's like family. So I'm sitting in here, like getting ready to have a conversation with y'all and just dive, not realizing we have an entire audience out there. My bad. So, yes. Coke, we'll start with you. Peace. What's up? Uh, my name is Coke. I am a musician, producer, uh, Grammy nominated artist from DC. Um, been working in music for over 20 years uh, through all sorts of genres from electronic music to hip hop to jazz music and, and punk. Thank y'all for having me. Next up, we have the illustrious, ever so famous, Angela Hunt. <laughs> that, I'm glad I'll give you your money after. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Angela Hunt. I was born in Brooklyn. I was raised in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm a proud Trinidadian slash American. Um, I've been doing music. It's going in at least 20-something years. Um, I'm very, very proud of it that I'm still here and I'm still resilient. Grammy Award winning has done pretty much almost every genre out there you could think from country to pop to Latin to, you know, you name it, I do it, and um, I'm happy to be here today. Cool, cool. And last but not least, we've got this amazing educator, producer, activist. Uh, I I'll let him tell y'all more. Young Guru, please introduce yourself, sir. Well, Angela left out one title, which I give her. She's the queen of Soka for me, so I give her that <laughs> title. <laughs> Without a doubt. Um, but yes, love. Maybe Great to see everybody. I'm Young Guru, uh, Grammy Award winning DJ, uh, engineer, producer. Uh, I've been in the business uh, professionally since 1996, but way before that, um, you know, hip hop is in my blood. It, it's my lifeline. It, it's what I am. Um, so everything that I am, you know, evolves out of that. I think that's a, a good enough introduction. Amazing. Amazing. We did have one more panelist, but unfortunately, He's unable to participate today again. His name was Shay. His name is Shay Pope. He just texted me, said he's going to try to pop in for a few minutes. So if he does, we'll we'll give him a little bit of time. Um, but we'll go back into that record. You want to reintroduce that, uh, James? Yeah. Um, again, I'm sorry for missing out on everybody's introduction. Skipping that. Get so excited with this topic. Um, it's so very rare that we get a chance to. Uh, shine a light on our, our, our heritage um, outside of just one month. So, you know, we're gonna try to knock everything out in as much time as we can. So it's gonna be a pretty, pretty jam-packed information-based uh, talk today. Uh, without burdening anybody else's eardrums, let's listen to Margaret Bonds, recognized as the first African-American composer with her rendition of, or, her rendition of Muddy, excuse me, Wade in the Water, entitled Trouble Waters. Let me know if everyone can hear this. Put a thumbs up. <laughs> faded out you guys pretty long song but I think everybody yeah. got the so you know to touch on that very quickly we all hear 
the foundation of Wade in the Water there, but her interpretation, and for, it's actually, I think it's almost like a six minute song, um, takes, the, takes the original to a lot of different places that, uh, that inspired Miss Bonds and uh, allowed her to express her creativity. That, uh, that's always been the nature of what happens with music, especially music from our perspective and our experiences. Um, you know, such innovation led to blues, led to, you know, from blues to ragtime, from ragtime to juke, from juke to jazz, you know, and, and variations in, in between there. Um, some of jazz is, jazz was actually, although it's founded in, it's recognized as being founded in New Orleans, it's an amalgamation of blues, ragtime, um, and attributed to, depending on who you talk to, some folks will say that Buddy Bolden founded jazz with his uh, first band in 1865. Yes, sir. Which is not too far from the uh, establishment of Juneteenth. Um, mm -hmm. Right, right along that that same line. And you talk to others, they'll tell you that uh, Jelly Roll Morton, you know, started yeah. jazz. Yeah. But uh, I, I'll take either one. Although I like Buddy Bolden's example because uh, his was the the most raw form of uh, of the art form and really expressed the frustration and creativity of that time and what came out of that. Amongst all those musicians that he pulled into his band, they were no joke. Um, what, what, do you got, what are you guys feeling about that? And what are your thoughts with regards to how music has evolved and, and uh, from this early space to I don't know if we're going to jump into where we are now, but just uh, the creativity of the spirit. Um, of, of I, I love, if I can start, I love that that example of uh, of Buddy Bolden. Number one, if we are to do a uh, a really complete history, it would take us forever, correct? But right, in, right. in the in the essence of time and that complete five minute thing that I do, uh, everything harkens us back to the motherland. Everything harkens us back to Africa. So right. the first thing we have to do is to recognize that there's thousands and thousands and thousands of years of music that was produced by us that we didn't necessarily hear. That was just passed down generation to generation, right? It wasn't recorded music and, and, and not even written down music. It was just right. tradition that was given to us. So then we, we go through what we went through in the Middle Passage. We come to this country and it's extremely interesting if you watch the specific history of New Orleans and the development of jazz and specifically Buddy Bolden because he lived blocks away from Congo Square. And mm -hmm. the people that know Congo Square and New Orleans understand that that was the place where the slaves got together and did their dance, the circular dance of presenting music. Um, <clears throat> this is 1819 in New Orleans. We have people that are talking about this thing called the ring shout. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was just a great example of, of where our ancestry is influencing what will come next. So I, I love that example of the Buddy Bolden because it, it, it directly ties us back to Africa and him being so close to these phenomena that we saw happen in New Orleans just for jazz. Guru, let me ask you something real quick um, before I let the other folks uh, offer their opinions. Do you think that um, music and the, and the creative spark in our music, the music of the Black experience, is a result of genetic imprinting through our experiences? I, I, it, 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 absolutely, all of your experiences come through your genetics. Right? right. All of your experiences are written down in your ancestors <clears throat> as they pass that on to you. Absolutely. Whether you're aware of it or not. Yes, whether, whether you're aware of it or not, their experiences are passed genetically through what they give you, right? Through your right. mother and your father. So right. if we look at what our tradition was in Africa, and again, when we say Africa, Africa is a continent. So there's plenty of different styles, forms, cultures that formed all throughout the motherland. And being that there's this missing link of, of specifically where we came from, 
we miss that part of knowing exactly I'm from here, I'm from there. We sort of take facial features and some of those things and try to match up where we came from. But we know that there's an amalgamation that happens when we come to this country. So if you look at our traditions of, of starting with those Negro spirituals, right? And if we say that that's around like the 17th or the 18th century, that's based off of our circumstance. That's based off of us coming into this country to instruments being taken away from us. Because as you explained, those instruments were being used to communicate. So then we have laws passed to where we cannot have drums, we cannot have any form of instrument but it really gets into the core of what it, the definition of an instrument was for us. We right. say instrument as a musical tool, but an instrument is anything that affects the outside world, the natural world, things that we created. So if, if we look at the biggest thing that happened to us when we came to this country, there's this huge separation between performer and audience when we didn't have that. Performer and audience to us was the same thing meaning that music was inside of our daily life. So if I take a rake and I'm singing while I'm raking, that is part of my daily life and the song becomes the rhythm to which I do these things. This is just one example. So the spiritual starts to, to, to come out of us because of the only place that we were allowed to actually uh, convene and to do things was inside of the church. So they became not only our spirituals for work, but they became our, our religious celebration or the way that, that we celebrated God. Um, we could go all the way through from the Negro spirituals to what happened on the chain gang to ragtime being created to ragtime being copied and, and creating minstrel shows, which then becomes, you know, interesting because right. these minstrel shows start out as, as us performing ourselves and using that, that rhythm of the left hand of ragtime and then freestyling on the right. And then people come down to the South for one day, look at that, take it back to New York, and then you have a bunch of white people that are doing that. And then black people, in order to feel like that they need to be on the scene, start imitating white people, imitating them, right? This is, mm. this is how our music develops, um, getting us all the way to our situation of one of our just most fundamental things, which is the blues. So the blues comes out of us because of our situation and because of, of what we're in and the expression that, that we want to get across. Um, the blues is also the place where I would say that um, authenticity becomes so important to us. This is, right. this is a, a, a presentation of music, but in order to do blues, people had to believe that you really went through that. You couldn't just get up and just fake the blues. So, mm -hmm. you know, these are, are the traditions that get us to the point of even creating. Jay. Of, of even getting to that thing in, in New Orleans. So when you say is it genetic with us, it's absolutely genetic. And we have to understand what, what sort of a melting pot and what time did, uh, because we also have what was going on um, uh, uh, with, with the revolution in Hispania, you know what I mean, what we call modern day Haiti. So we mm -hmm. have, right. we have uh, examples of people fleeing that revolution and, and like in one year, 6,000 people, you know, of color going into New Orleans. You mix that with the French because we, that's what, you know, that area was colonized by. Then you mix that with the Africans that were there. That's how you get this sort of music that is, that is like this, what I call our classical music of today is jazz music. So right. for me, to answer your question, yes, it does come genetically, but it also, you have to understand that, that what you imprint into yourself, your life experience, you are passing that on to your child. To your so child, all, right. All, right, all right. the things that we did, and if you take instruments away from us, we start using the human body as an instrument. Voice becomes very important. Right. Tapping becomes very important. Beating on the body, beating on objects, all of these things become very important, which then you get to see yourself again later on in hip hop when we get to a Reagan era where music is taken out of schools and the young kids start beating on a table and they start using their mouth as the instrument and start, and then rap becomes the thing. So we can, you need to know your history to know that this thing didn't just start with you banging on a table. That's genetically in you to make an instrument mm -hmm. out of whatever is around you. Koyar, can, Koyar, can you speak and feel free <laughs> anybody to speak on this too, Angela? And Shay just joined us as well. What's up, Shay? Thank you for joining us. Hey, what's up, sir? Y'all gotta forgive me. I'm on day day four now, my quarantine. Oh wow. Oh, so wow. okay. I can't even get a test in LA right now. That's how crazy it is out, out here. You really? Can't even crazy, man. It's, it's just yeah, my that's what I mean about those mixed messages, because we're hearing differently. That's that's messed mm -hmm. up. Well, we're praying for you, ma'am. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Sure. Absolutely, bro. I, I wanted to talk about the, the instruments because Guru, you made a good point. A lot of we mm -hmm. touched on this on, on Juneteenth when we had our previous discussion about a lot of people don't know 
the the drums, the piano, the guitar, the banjo, these all came from Africa. You know, Did the more brought that to Europe. Um, Koya, I would love for you to elaborate on, on those instruments um, or anyone else on the call can can elaborate on those instruments and 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 kind of tie it all in on how, how it's still used today. For sure. I mean, I was I, I like what Guru said. I, I, I look at the way that we sang our songs as the Rosetta Stone for yes. black people at that time. That's what songs were. That's even though we had this mix of heritage and these mix of, of, of lineage and different spaces in Africa that we came from. What we had once we learned those shouts and hollers is we found a language through music. So that was our Rosetta Stone then as we accommodated to the language of our oppressor. Um, when you talk about the instrumentation that was there, drums was a specific part of, of African history and the loop of the African lyre, which, you know, has which morphed into the banjo. And if you notice, those blues uh, transferred into what was country music what they call country music and country music got distinguished from blues and what they call hillbilly music uh, during the time that race records came about. Um, so they had to differentiate because uh, blues are synonymous with black folks. And so they had yeah. to call white people using the banjo and learning banjo from black people. They had to call that country music in order to differentiate uh, from black music. Um, because they, they couldn't identify with it as black music. Those instruments, the lyre, guitar, bass, and drums have always been instrumental throughout uh, our history of, as a people. That's the rhythm section, right? You have the rhythm section and the, and the, and the melody section. You have the, the bottom, you have the, the, the bass and the drums are those things that communicate that the, the syncopation that we need, the rhythm, the heartbeat of who we are. And then you have that melodic instrument that comes in and plays the messages, right? So that's how I look at the guitar and the piano is the thing that relays the messages. And all of these things are inferred when you take away the voice. So these are inferred, you know, these are emotions that have to be expressed through instruments in order to convey a message without the voice actually being there, which is so poignant when you talk about when you move into blues, uh, country music uh, and hip hop, the words then are able, the, the ways that we're able to express the sounds that we were communicating that had to be inferred. Awesome. There's also, I, I just want to add on, Mario, one, one thing, I, I would be remiss if I don't say this. Um, one of the things that we lost is that we were put onto a Western scale when we came, musically, when we came into this country. So I would be remiss if I didn't put that in people's minds that the Western scale is not the only scale in music. We look at these other scales as abstract scales after we learn Western music and almost base them off of Western music, but that comes from a certain psychology of saying that this is the dominant music, or trying to explain to somebody that the piano in and of itself is a preset, right? That there are notes that the piano cannot hit. There's, there's Indian songs that you can't play on the piano. There's African songs that you cannot play on the piano because those notes are not represented. So right. you have to also realize that, and, and I'm tracing this so that when we get into the future, we can see exactly what we do. No matter what instrument we're given, no matter what the limitations are, we figure out a way to make infinite amount of music from those instruments. So you have to remember too that there's not just this one scale, that there's a million scales. And we were utilizing all of those different things, but now our, our, our thinking sort of comes from this Western perspective, which was us being colonialized and, and through slavery. So it's just, it's just another great example. Later on when we get to, you know, again, not having all of the things that we need or utilizing certain tools like beat machines and things that weren't made to be to, to be used the way that we are using them. You know, that was us being given something limited and making something out of it. So I would be remiss if I didn't point that particular point out as we move along and see all these great forms of music that we created. Out of nothing. Yeah. The music we create out of nothing. Yeah. Right. Like, out of nothing. Right. Out of nothing. Out of Andrew. nothing. I remember just being like, just, you know, when you talk about using the things that are around you, like it brings me back to like being young in Trinidad and watching, you know, whole sections of like people in rhythm sections, they would have hubcaps, bottles, mm -hmm. bottle caps, you know, washboards, which some kids right. today probably don't right. even know what that is. Um, you know, how, you know, the tall of the bottle, the slim of the bottle, the greener, the color, the, 
you know, the wine bottle is different from a Coca-Cola bottle. And the is filled with water. <laughs> and, and right, 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 exactly. Right, right, right. You know, um, the conch shell, you know, which right. which which a soca song that just came out by Marshall Montano just used it. And he, I watched this man on stage blow this conch shell into notes that was like, I was like, how can the human body do that? But it's a testament as to what we had to do with what we had. And it's like, I think about, they. I remember when they took the music program at my school. And I remember Dougie Fresh coming to my school and I was like, what is that? And he was, <laughs> right. I was like, how is, is he, you know, it, there was no DJ playing, he was just making the music with his mouth. Right. And, you know, today, it saddens me so much to see like the artists today, they're so privileged. Like even certain, uh, you know, programs that I've been to that I've, that I've spoken at and I'm just like, y'all got studios in here and, mm -hmm. and all these amazing people coming to, you know, to talk to you guys. And wow, I, I, I've, I've, I've never seen anything like that. And it, it, it almost is like, dad, if I had those, I had, we had nothing to, to do except beat on tables. And it's crazy how much that is not understood today. Like you had to be on a table and you better keep your time and you better keep your rhythm or you gotta get out the circle. Right, you right, know? right. I remember you know, so, I, we, we had ciphers, you know, back in the 90s, we, you know, a lot of MCs hip hop was obviously, you know, at all time, one of the best moments of hip hop was in the 90s. And I remember like we had ciphers in school where, you know, I, w I was the beatboxer in school. That was my thing. Even before DJing, like people know that Mario was the beatboxer. Right. And we had right. beatbox battles, we had ciphers, this MC versus another MC at, an, at a different school. And, and I, you know, I'm not in school anymore, but I don't tend, I don't know if that still takes place or not, you know? It takes like, place. It takes place. It's yeah. still here. It's I mean, but that's, that's shouts and hollers though. Yeah. That's us, right. that's yeah. part of response. That's part of the African space. That's what we do. You know, we hop and, in and, and, and it's, the, the, it's the time of the grill. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add on the point. I didn't mean to cut you off, Coke, but to, but no to problem. add on the point, Michael, this is also me from the engineering standpoint, understanding that certain, you start to learn certain things. So in my junior high school, as I'm beatboxing, I learned that if I turn around and go to the corner and beatbox into Absolutely. the corner, it became super loud. So I'm right. learning acoustics just right. naturally, but not right. really right. knowing what that means. I just know it sounds better. Instead of me doing it this way, I went in the corner. So we started to learn even techniques and things that were that were yeah. uh, science that yeah, we didn't really what you did. You were learning right. those things. Right. right. How many, how many gonna... times? How many times people have taken for granted when you see the break dancers and the guys on the pail, you know, they could not afford drunk. Right. It wasn't right. that they wanted to be on, you know, and on 42nd Street, you know, busting down a pail, but listen to what they were able to accomplish with that bucket. Right. right. That is go-go music in DC as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it, if you look at jazz music, a part of the iteration and the, and the impetus came out of the fact that there's, these were discarded instruments. They weren't using certain instruments, so they threw those instruments away, just like they would take pieces of the pig that, that weren't supposed to be eaten and giving them to black folks, and we turn that into cuisine, right? We turn these instruments that have been discarded into the cuisine for the ear. You know, this is, this is what we do. And that syncopation, that's that genetic, historical, intangible memory that still exists within us. And when you take it to go-go music, I mean, that's syncopation from Africa direct, right? Mm -hmm. coming, from, right. From, coming through Chuck Brown, and then you, 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 ha you have this idea of the pocket, you have Congos, you have these, these African instruments uh, all coming together to form this indigenous music form that only exists here right, that we think only exists here until you get junkyard or, or backyard going to Ghana and then finding these through lines, like, like how that, mm. that all relates. Or go down to Matanzas um, in, in Cuba. I studied with the rumberos down there. And when, and when you sit there and you learn how to play on concolo and you start listening to how these different instruments communicate with one another, right, and when, with the bata drum. And then I think back to, oh my God, this sound like smoke smacking, you know, at the club. So I'm, I'm hearing him use a set of congos that three people play to do these call and response rhythms. And so, you know, always find it interesting. I look at how we as a people, this is what we do. We make something out of nothing. Um, and so when you look at black music, indigenous black music that comes from the United States, now I feel like that same music is starting to affect uh, uh, 
other places in the diaspora. So black music and black culture now influences African culture, which then creates a whole other form, which then pours back into black indigenous black culture here and throughout the Caribbean. Right. Yeah. One it's thing funny, I want it's to funny on. when you hear Afro music now being played, I don't mean to cut you off. It just makes me laugh when I see these <laughs> youngsters respond to it. I'm like, it's always been here. It's right. been right. in you. You just right. you just get right. they're like, this right. is amazing. I'm like, right. this is this is where you this is the grassroots. <laughs> right. right. This is right us. here. <laughs> like this is real us. Life. Right. That's that's right. that's why you feel like that's like right. This. That's right. You that's know, what I was gonna speak to. Right. It's, it's pour it's pouring out of them, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no I, I want to speak on the group point of, of what Coke was saying about like one thing starts to influence the other, which is a huge thing for me because it's like as we develop, we, we kind of stopped that jazz, but you know, we kept going in, in the United States, right? We mm -hmm. created R&B, we created rock and roll, we create mm -hmm. all these things. And then you take, say, someone in the islands who's listening to ska music, but also being influenced by the modern day R&B at a time, and then combines all that to make reggae. You know, we start mm -hmm. building these other things and then, okay, well, I'm gonna take the, the, the emphasis, not necessarily on the one and the three, but the emphasis is going to be on the two and the four, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and technology coming in to where we're like playing one guitar note, and it's you know we're putting that through a delay, so somebody's listening again now to this on the radio, and instead mm -hmm. of just going to chick, the thing went chicka, and then the guitar thinks think he's going chicka chicka chicka, and then we create reggae. So it's just like mm -hmm. all of these things are influences of of, of people listening mm -hmm. to other forms of black music and saying, mm -hmm. okay, let me make my combination of what that thing is and right. we always create this new form of music based off of our environment and our own personal experience right you guys Hello. touched on an important important term the griot mm -hmm. um, <laughs> many people may not know what the griot what was the purpose of the griot back in the day and they still exist today i would love for any one of you to to illustrate who is and what does a griot do Griot was our storytellers, but in, in telling these stories, they were history keepers. I was just saying, the historian of culture. Yeah, it was not being written down. And it, it was, was also, the Bible. Yeah, it was also right. Yeah, it was, it, it was the way that we communicated. But one of the essence of, and this is something that I've been studying by studying the Dogon, is that we're now finding out that the Dogon tribe knew about quantum physics and was yep. teaching quantum physics thousands of years ago, but explaining it to their children through stories of beetles, animals right. that are around them, taking everyday thing that the child sees and making science make sense to them by creating a story about story. a beetle. Okay. But I'm, I'm really telling you about science and how the world was created. Mm -hmm. so that's Absolutely. What our, that's Absolutely. What they were. Beautiful. They were our history keepers, but they were also our science teachers, our storytellers, our poets, and a lot of that was set to music. Right. right. Right, that's yeah. beautiful. Thank you for that's sharing perfectly, that. perfectly, perfectly put. Perfectly. Yeah. Um, something you touched on earlier, Guru, and I, I'd like to get back to that. Um, Ray Charles is known as the genius. Mm. He started out originally in gospel, but mm. then he took, and, and he's actually, he was, the, if you want to call him the first black executive mm. um, in, the, in modern music, you could call him that also because he purchased his own masters and publishing is very and was very much aware of the power of his music and the po power of intellectual property back when that wasn't exposed to us. It was an incredible time. The two brothers he bought it from, they said, I'm mad at you, but I'm proud yep. of you. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. Right. So he took Ray took the elements of blues, mm -hmm. race music back in the time, what was known as, which, which was R&B, but it was called race music back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in order for it to get assimilated and, and digested by the larger culture, it became R&B, rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. and then gospel, and mm -hmm. created what we now know, or what then became known in the 50s as soul music. Mm -hmm. It then became appropriated and, and funked up a little bit more by artists such as Little Richard, um, Chuck Berry, mm -hmm. Sam Domino. Cook, Bo Diddley, mm -hmm. and that became, that became R&B. That solidified the R&B sound. How did R&B, how the heck did R&B and all our cats that designed that, <laughs> that, that, that genre, how, how did, how it, 
how did Alan Freed get away with renaming and appropriating a whole genre to uh, calling it rock and roll? Well, Anybody yeah. want to tackle that? Yeah, you have to, you have to again, remember the times of- I got to go there, Angela, I'm sorry. I had to go there. Oh, no, no, if, if my sister wants <laughs> yeah. to go, let her go. Let her go. No, no, know. no, I was, I was like, woo, that was- Folks got to know. Was, we're, this, right. we're talking about the, ele the evolution and manifestations of our music, mm -hmm. and that's important for people to know. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so what, in, I mean, in order to understand your future, you have to know your past. Yeah, Absolutely. You, you, you got to look at the time we was in, too. And right. why he was right. able to get away with because the time we right. was in, it was, right. it, it, you know, it was like slipping from your fingers. It was nothing you can do. You know what right. I'm saying? Go ahead. Go ahead, G. No, that was my, that was going to be my point. Let's remember the time that we're in. Let's remember mm -hmm. uh, where black people were in the country at the given time. And that's the answer to the question as to how somebody can come in and steal your whole thing and say, oh, well, Elvis and, and this and that. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, no, you're a watered down version of this. So mm -hmm. if, if the, um, again, it's, it's like what we did with Ragtime, where it was just like, okay, if the black uh, artist creates this thing, the white audience at that time is not going to have even a black performer on the stage. We can't even be in the same room. Mm -hmm. So we're going to paint our face black to emulate that. And then we're going to act yeah. like we created this thing. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what happens is that we have artists that come out, but because we're not the power structure at the time, think about mm -hmm. that. We had radio stations that were uh, separated by race, right? This radio right. station only played what was called black music. This radio station only played white music. Then mm -hmm. you have us coming through and creating this rock and roll. And then there's certain mentalities that come because of that, right? Mm -hmm. so a lot of times when we look at the genius of a Motown or something like that, it's not that Barry Gordy in, in his trying to make the Supremes, you know, walk with books on their head and walk upright and mm -hmm. make only this type of music. It, he wasn't trying to water the music down. He's trying to make a statement to say, no, I'm taking this music and I'm mm -hmm. gonna force white radio to play this right. music. So that we can kill this thing called race radio. Yeah. Right. You know, right trying to present our music on every level and say, no, everybody's supposed to be able to buy this music. Music mm -hmm. is the main thing that even when we had a segregated South, the artists were so big that they had to literally put a rope in the middle of the room and say, okay, this is the white side, this is the black side, but everybody want to come see this particular artist. Mm -hmm. right. Everybody everybody want to go see James Brown. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. Don't nobody want to go see him. They want to go right. on this side of the room. And they're, you had people like the people like that that they was trying to hold down. The reason why you could come in and you could snatch something, because you know you're looking at a group of people mm -hmm. that have been unlawfully taught to be ashamed of who they are, what they are, and how to even speak up. So that that person's looking at that and going, "Well, it's free game. I'm gonna come in and I'm just gonna take all this. Their, their clothes, their style, the way they sing, the way they act, mm -hmm. the way they move. Like, you know." Just even, even Nat King Cole, just looking at him, his whole, every way he, nobody in that music, in that mm -hmm. genre was presenting themselves the way he presented himself. Mm -hmm. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So it was easy to come in because it was like everyone was afraid and didn't even know what was going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Half right. of these artists didn't even know that, but isn't that me? You know? Right. You and, know and, so I mean, part of it, part of it too, though, we have to, we have to recognize, we have to understand that white people the race racism in america will make you think differently like do you want a poster yeah. of chuck berry on your young 16 year old daughter's wall or do you want that picture of elvis and you really got to make that choice do i want you up here worshiping this person who we know is the originator or i'm more comfortable with seeing my own kind if we really want to talk about it kendrick eminem we're not going to say that Eminem is not the dopest rapper. We're not going to say that. He, he's a dope rapper. But what is white America more comfortable with? A white rapper on the wall or the black rapper on the wall or their teenage daughter's room? Period. Like that's, and that's the fear, the innate fear that America has is that black people are going to be so dominant that it erases some part of their culture or it erases who they are or their daughter's going to fall in love with black men and then it's going to populate the world. I mean, we can get into that all day, but. I'm just being, I'm just keeping it a solid two versions. Absolutely. Yeah, we gotta look at the physical structures that was going on too back then. So let's understand what was going on. We could, we could talk about simple things like uh, property values and redlining right. and things of that right. nature, right? Where we right. Mm -hmm. go on a map and we go, okay, well, this property's worth this, this property's worth that. One of the things that we see is that even with 
the construction of redlining, we had pockets of black areas where people started to, in segregation, because we had our own barbershops, we had our own beauty salons, we had our own everything, we start to see some wealth come up. But even if I'm wealthy on the black side, my five acres of land is not worth the same as the five acres right. of land acres on this across side. Across the tracks. Right. right. So systematically, if you say, well, where were the black record companies? Where were the black this and that? It was like, no, it's not that easy for a black person in the South to go own the building and have to deal with it. Look at what we're dealing with now when somebody gets to that right. level. But I'm talking about yes. back then when the whole when the whole city was the KKK. So the right. police, the judge, everybody was, no, we're not going to allow y'all to build up this wealth. So you right. had black artists, but they're going to certain record labels. And of course, back then, they're signing all the publishing away. They don't know what's going on. Right. right. That, are, that are playing, you know, for $300 a week and, and, and right. are writing some of the greatest songs that we're going to sing forever mm -hmm. in your publishing. You know, right. look at look at the people that played with Bob Marley in Jamaica. Like it's right. like, okay, we didn't we didn't have public. They was like, yo, we got a check. We split it three ways. We didn't deal with none of that. We didn't write right. down different things. So right. we didn't necessarily have all the information at the given time. So we right. really put it in a historical context of why some of these things get to happen because mm -hmm. of the position of us. We're 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 looking trying to get equality, but we never got equity. You know what I mean? Right. Because we're starting so low, it takes so much just for us to get back to zero. Right. So Which is still practice today. Right. right. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the most underrated and unspoken about um, uh, writers of that era of the early R and B and rock and roll era. Well, rock and roll. I'll say rock and roll, but uh, because many of those artists used his songs was Bumps Blackwell. Mm. Yes. Now, yes. Bumps Blackwell mm -hmm. wrote all, many of this, most of the songs for Little Richard um, and Sam Cooke. And it wasn't until artists like Pat Boone, Elvis, you know, and, and even Chuck Berry, uh, you know, he wrote with Chuck. Uh, many of those, uh, many of those other artists that, that appropriated their music uh, used him as a, as a co-writer. But you never hear that about him. You never really hear about him in the uh, conversations of great composers or great songwriters. Mm -hmm. And he's he's a big contributor to rock and roll, the foundations of rock and roll. Right. And that could definitely be attributable to those times. Right. And the yeah, lack of uh, happens. This happens across just a couple generations. So for people right. that want, like like for us, right, in my generation, when I was born, there was no such thing as sampling laws. Right. right. So mm -hmm. hip hop coming about and us going through this, you know, miraculous uh, Biz Marquis case was probably the right. fundamental case. I remember, right. that. Right. I remember when that went down. Yeah. This. So if we go back and do the history, we did not even have phonographic recordings until 1877. Right. right. And that's the right. cylinder ones. Right. Right. And it takes us another couple of years to, before we even get to the plaque. Then the mute, that's to show you that the music business, as we know it, is only really about 150 years old. Right. So if, right. If, right. If, right. If, right. If, right. If you look at who was writing music back then, the rules were being written as this was going on. So it's right. not like people didn't go, oh, okay, let me figure this out. They were just musicians that were like, okay, I'm getting my music out. They had no right. idea about mass duplication, how far this could go. A lot of them coming from the South and everywhere had never seen like, oh, these records is gonna go to Europe, they're gonna go to Africa, right. no right. idea. You're right. just trying to get your music out and you're trying to get paid. So it wasn't out of just pure ignorance. It, it, I'm stressing that it was the times. It was it was the times. Right. You're right. You mentioned a very good point. Um, at the at the uh, the invention of of the phonograph, you had cats go down to record blues artists like Lead Belly, blues mm -hmm. artists like Robert Johnson, mm -hmm. and a lot of those old recordings were were recorded just like, like or documented just like you just illustrated yeah. with those cylinders. Mm -hmm. um, many of which those records that you hear that exist to this day um, were recorded in that fashion. You know? but yeah, just, it's, it's, just to put that in a historical perspective so that people don't, you know, sometimes it's like almost like us where we, where we say, oh, well, if I was in slavery, I would have just broke out and out of rent. Right. It's like, no, you got to take <laughs> right. the whole, like, <laughs> right. like, like the whole zeitgeist of what was going on, right? The mm -hmm. zeitgeist, the, the feel of the times and, and the complete narrative of what it felt like to be in those times. So mm -hmm. right. again, with music, now we come up and we have the internet and we can read about publishing and we got all these war stories about people that got jerked and we're warned by other people. Mm -hmm. When I went mm -hmm. to Howard University, the main thing that my OGs did was sit me down in a room with a whiteboard and said, look, 
Forget all this is publishing. This is the music business. This right. is besides the flash, besides this is how you get paid. How right. much of the song do you own? That is the right. music business in and of itself. Right. How much of the song do you own? Right. That's it. You right. know, it's funny that you say that. I'm going to go back to Bumps Blackwell. <laughs> Bumps Blackwell had an academy where he taught students, you know, not just mm -hmm. music, but the, the business. Mm -hmm. He yes. wanted them to know specifically the business. And, um, you know, his <clears throat> motto was, uh, I don't want you to, I don't want you to go through what I went through, right. what Little Richard went through, right. what we all went through at that time. Right. And he made it. He made it a mantra. I think his school opened in 1985, mm. and it's uh, here in in the valley in Sherman Oaks. They have uh, the institute. I mean, that's why I don't you know, me. never hear about that. The yeah. uh, Bumps Bla or the Blackwell International Academy of Performing Arts. Mm. No, it you don't hear about that. Yeah. yeah, no. I would. I, I would never. Passing. I would never. That was 85. Want someone to go through what I went through. And I, I do my best diligently every time I work with someone to just chip off a piece of knowledge that I've learned. Because unfortunately, I've had to learn the hard way in right. every in every aspect. And I never, you know, this business cannot be a self-pity party. Y'all know that. Like, you, 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 you know, there's a lot of people that go about it that way. You pay, you learn something. Oh, shit, that was real messed up. Right. Okay, I've learned a lesson from that, you know, because you know, for me, and I don't, I don't, I don't like to make it a a, a, a man and a woman thing, but there mm -hmm. are some instances where things are a little different for me. Speak your but truth. I, speak your yeah, truth, you know? just tell it, <laughs> you know, please, please. Things, right. things, things are different for me because you know, my mentor was Salam Remy, right? Oh, and Salam okay. is a gearhead, and so I was around gear. I was a board baby. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was a, my first demo was on a C12, mm -hmm. you know, and, and because I was raised and brought up around all these musicians with Salam and his dad and, you know, constantly them feeding me knowledge about, listen, when you're in the studio, you, you are a great writer. Like you're okay right now. But if you know this, mm -hmm. if you know how to sit there and tell the engineer, Hey, you know, this is, this is where my compression level needs mm -hmm, to be at. Mm -hmm, this is exactly this mm -hmm. is the type of mic that sounds good on my voice. Mm -hmm. You will raise the bar. And I try to tell people all the time, although yes, as, as women, we've had some messed up experiences and there's a two sided edge to that. Cause there were some rooms that I was like, Oh, I'm not going in there. Cause I know what's going to happen in there. And everybody doesn't have that perception, but I was blessed to have amazing men around me, you know? And, and, you know, from Puffy to Andre to, you know, I remember Andre coming in my room as a young girl. I was on tour with Hammer mm. and I was young. And I would, people just used to look at me and be like, damn, this girl is like different. And I had Hiram Hicks and, and you know, all these great men, Shaquem Compare that, you used to see all these amazing black men. And to me, they just look like stallions, you know, like they were just so tall. And I just saw all these black powerful men on their cell phones with their briefcases. <laughs> and <That's laughs> they just, That's right. you know what I'm saying? And they should just be like, yo, Ange, we don't know, but we got you, you different. Right. And, I, you know, there are men that do take you under your wing and really teach you. And all these men taught me something. Andre taught me like resilience. He always used to be like, Yo, you just need to don't stop. And every time, you know, he, he was the one who told me that every time a door closes, that that's just the person you're not supposed to be talking to. Right. So I like to really let people know that, listen, there are men out there that will mentor you, that are great, that will teach you. Yeah, and I'm absolutely. grateful. If it absolutely. wasn't for Salam, you know, when I get in a room and I start talking to somebody, like, I'm like, yo, your drums, they, they got to hit this way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm right into it and I got to feel it so way and I'm telling you because I was blessed enough to be around some great dudes that taught me great music and women as well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the downside of it sometimes is, you know, like as a woman, you got to push a little bit harder as a black woman who started off in pop music because I was told from day one, I had one of the whitest pens for a black <laughs> young girl that they had ever seen. And I didn't understand what that meant. I remember looking, going at this executive, 
all right, does that mean like I write like white songs? I don't understand because when you when you grow up in a Caribbean atmosphere, we listen to everything. Right. Right. Like, pop that country so you to marginalize you to get you to right. marginalize yourself. Right. That's the brainwashing. They recognize your age and figured if they plant that seed early, that's mm -hmm. the only lane that you're gonna stay in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've I fought to to say, but I wanna do everything. Yes, mm -hmm. I know R and B and yes, I know hip hop and I love hip hop. I came up with hip hop, you know, mm -hmm. from Easy Mo B was another one of my mentors who who sit me down and tell me and make me listen to all these jazz records and make me listen to all these doo-wop records and go, mm -hmm. you can incorporate what you do, which is your street stuff, <clears throat> and listen to this. Mm -hmm. You know, listen to the way this guy, I got five on it. Like, mm -hmm. and you know, so I think it's just important that I, like just young women who are listening and just young people as a whole, we throw all this information at them. And they're a generation of like, oh, I'll go, oh, you know, they feel bad when they don't know something. Mm -hmm. There's things that, I, that, that you guys are mentioning that I did not know until this year. Mm. And I'm not ashamed to say that. Like, this is the one craft that you learn all the time. You never all stop the learning time. this. All There's the times time. I wake up and I'm like, damn, what note was that? Or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> listening to watching a whole program on African drums and learning that there are drums that cannot be played on any instrument. Because right. they those notes, I never knew that right. until right. a month ago. Like this quarantine time has forced me to learn so much about myself and my mm -hmm. craft and and all the things that I didn't know. You know, this is this is you know everything I, we have to learn. We have to make mistakes. We don't always have the silver spoon in our mouth, and we never wanted the silver spoon shoved in our mouth. Right. I wanted to learn it like everybody else. Right. But, you know, my parents couldn't afford college, so I had to go out there and find people to teach me the things that I was hearing in my head, mm -hmm. you know? And I was lucky enough to get easy, and then I was lucky to get Salam, and then, you know, my career where I am now, I'm with a great mentor, which is Buddha, who, that man embodies every instrument and every genre. He taught me, like, there's no genre you can't do, Angela. Let me play you right. these Bunchata records. Let me, you know, this is the difference between Cumbia and, this, and how, you know, right. we incorporate it in everything that we do today. So, you know, I think it's super important to let people know, like, you cannot be afraid to learn and keep learning. This is so important, what both of these gentlemen are saying, because it coming from you resonates so much different. And the way that you say it and the way that you explain it, if you don't want to sit here and, and, and understand that there is a path and that will help you to where you have to go. And the reason why all these sounds are coming into play today is coming into play because there's nowhere else to go. Right. Pop music does right. what we do. Right. If we excuse the term fuck up and don't put out good music, pop ain't gonna be good that year. Right. Cause no, they just me, watch me, what me, we do. Go against that whole thing right there, Angela. And this is, this is to reinforce what you're saying. There really is no thing as pop. Pop is the <laughs> same thing as when we were saying before and saying, oh, this is country music now right. because white people are doing right. it. Right, right. So pop Very is true. Not, pop is not a genre of music. Right. So even the, 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 the easiest way, my son doesn't even understand when he would say to me, okay, well, if this is pop and 75% of what's now pop, you learn music is urban right. music, then why are we still calling it pop? Calling because it pop. Right. Separate right. Radio because we want to separate right. awards we want right. to separate money we want to separate right. history. so we're pop we're the pop right. music at this right. point you should, you exactly know, so right the only right. thing that pop to me is not even a genre of music mm -hmm. we can right. other music so so to me that needs to be erased that thing of pop but then that would erase the the, the systematic racism that has been set up speak on it this is speak a on pop it. radio <laughs> speak on it. right speak on it <laughs> No, I mean, because black people are not monoliths and black music is not monolithic. That's right. the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like, we have these different expressions. You're not going to tell me. I grew up in a city with Bad Brains, Chuck Brown, yes. Duke Ellington. Right. You know what I mean? And, and when you talk about hip hop, when hip hop hit D.C., you had mad hip hop groups. I remember Guru being at Urban Intellect mixing on the San Sui six track. And, my, and if you didn't know, Guru, that was my great aunt's house. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. my great aunt's house. I did oh, not Park know. Road. I I yeah, didn't Park know Road. <laughs> so Park Road is my great aunt's house. You know, that's where my, my grandmother's sister, you know, was right there. That was Aunt Ray's house. 
and her mm. kids, Bill was with Yvonne. Yvonne is my cousin. And wow. so that's, you know, that's it's, these are the, these are those tenuous connections, but yo, man, I grew up around, you know, my father from Bed-Stuy, New York, my mom from Tampa W Northwest. So I've been listening to everything. I was listening to Ida Kede. I was listening to, to Shorty Rogers, listening to Bob James, John Coltrane, Gap Band, Cabaret Voltaire, Blondie, yeah, Kiss. Okay. You know Cabaret what I mean? This is, this is my brother. My brother loved everything rock and roll. He was the one that put me on the Jimmy. He was the one that put me on Velvet Underground. He was putting me onto the, all these different artists. And then living in D.C., coming up with Go-Go, this, these are all the things that help make us. So, of course, when we get out here, we're going to make this music that's been part of our history, that's been part of our lineage. I look at how what they did with techno. Techno and house music is not EDM, right? EDM, white people are not the progenitors <laughs> of, of dance music. Let's just keep it a solid one, right? You, you got techno invented by some black brothers out of Detroit. You that's have... Up. You have house music, Chicago house, Baltimore. Coming out of Chicago tradition, you know, yes. Coming out this yeah. Chicago tradition, and folks take that and throw some regular chords on it, and then they're going to call that EDM or, or Euro dance music. Like, come on, let's get it right. You know what well, I mean? Yeah. You look at Diplo, I mean, look at Diplo and Switch. Yeah. All they did was took Caduro, which is Angolan music from the, from the Portuguese being the captors there in Angola, pushing that thing back through, through Portugal. And, and you have uh, groups like Baraka Son Sistema, which been rocking Angola dance, Angolan dance right, for right, right. decades. And now when Diplo and Switch do it, when they, when they work on Santi Gold's record, everybody think that's the new sound. That's the new vibe. Exactly, right. exactly. It's, exactly. It's, it's African dance. That, that, right. that goes right. back even further than that, too, because, I mean, I was going to talk about salsa. We all know that the African influence was salsa music originating in Cuba. Right. Um, and, and one thing that really touches with me a lot uh, is reggaeton music because my right. family is Panamanian. So right. many, many, many people feel that reggaeton started in Puerto Rico, but it actually started in Panama. Right. And, right. It, and it started by <clears throat> gentlemen, five dudes. They went by the, um, what were the name? The Parliament Pacific All Stars. Mm, so mm -hmm. what they would do in Panama City is ride around in the public buses and perform their reggaeton songs. And they got obviously influenced by reggae music in Jamaica and, and, and in, the, in, the, in the Latin culture, they add the tone to make them big. So they was like, it's not reggae, but we're gonna call it reggaeton. And they started rapping in Spanish and they would perform on the buses to the point where they got so much demand that the bus drivers paid them to give them mixtapes so they can play these songs on the buses to people as they rode the buses. But what happened from there is that these guys were black and they would live in the hoods in Panama City and they never, they never got that push because, they, because the, the people who had the resources and the money felt like they weren't, they weren't, their skin weren't clear enough. They right. were too dark to be marketed. And one of those gentlemen happened to be El General, which we all are familiar with. And he's the yeah. first one to break out with, you know, to boom, boom. He, he broke out and that became a worldwide hit. But people don't know that reggaeton started in Panama, did not start in Puerto Rico. And it was called Plena before it was called reggaeton. Right. While we're doing the history, there's another one that we got to really, that. really change up. And this one shocks a lot of people and they're going to give you a lot of pushback on this. Tell them. But there's a band called Death, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yep. sir. Yep. Talk yep. about <laughs> it. Talk so, about it. What, what's so beautiful about this is that we have three brothers from Detroit who played mm -hmm. punk music a year prior to CBGB's even being open. That's up. right. Right. That's right. So I just I just learned about this. Yes. yes. Literally. So there, there is this argument now for us to present that we created punk, right? Yes. So I, I would, there's a DVD and there's also this book by one of the mm -hmm. Hackley brothers, but it's a really deep story and it is a circle story of. Um, the digger culture of, a, of mm -hmm. children going back and digging music and being at a party and hearing a voice and going, hold up, that's my uncle. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, the, same way, the same way we heard, if we heard Angela voice on some random record that we didn't know, we're going to go, hold on, I know that voice. Right, right, right. 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 Him as, right. him as a beat digger, as, as someone who's in the culture that I'm in that, where we go back and we search for these old records and we love right. digging for old records, he then goes to his father and says, were you in a band that plays such? And the father had put the music sitting up in the, in the closet somewhere because now they didn't transform into a reggae band. So right. what he thought was a failure is actually proof 
that he was doing punk music prior to the people that we give credit to. So right, 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 right. right. Hey, Guru, I think there's a documentary on Prime about them. Yes, man. yeah, called Band Called Death. Yeah, yeah, Band yeah, Called Death, right? Is incredible, incredible. Yeah, I, it is. I, I would yeah. advise everybody to go watch it. The brothers are out. You know, they're touring. They're back. You know, and 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 they replaced one of the brothers, but they are out touring and, and showing people exactly who they are, how this album was created. I think that documentary is is almost it's like required for us at this point. Yeah, yeah. it's absolutely yeah. required yeah. for sure. Yeah, I want to on YouTube uh, or uh, Prime. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I just, I, you know, that hit a real sore spot for me, and I, I gotta talk about it. I gotta talk about the techno and the EDM. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Listen, because you know, I was introduced to various people that you know is ended up being this damn tropical whatever it's called. Um, but it's soca music. Right. It is what right. it is. Right. And, Talk about you know, it. I think it's, it, you have to be honest and you have to say there was a point in time that there were a couple of us female writers who had Caribbean backgrounds that were used. You know, I was one of the first writers to go, see this DJ thing? They, this is about to be the new artist. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because I was, and I, I moved to London and I was doing a lot of garage and drum and bass. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. <clears throat> You know, and I was I was immersed in that world and I saw where it was going and I met a lot of these, you know, white guys that was like, yo, could you just come in? And, you know, at that in the beginning, it was just kind of like just say one word and they would repeat the word over and over again. And then at some point I was like, but if you put a song to this mm -hmm. and but not just a song, because at the time and if they was a song on it, it was just kind of like it, it was it was cute. It didn't really make a lot of sense. It was just like words thrown into the record. I was like, but if you put a song song and you make a song to this and you start throwing in all these, a couple little different, inf you know, influences, this could be something different. And so I started to take a lot of instrumentals from these DJs, Diplo, you know, a lot of them, of course, Don Diablo, like all these different DJs from Europe. And I started writing songs. And what, what you start getting is something that they was missing. The meat and potato. The culture of it. The culture of it. Because, you know, you could all you want. Right. You know what I'm saying? If, if, if that thing ain't there, it, 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 it becomes something different. So when you start coming in with all these different, I want you to know how I feel. Come in and know how I feel. In order to say how I feel. Shmeel. Hey, hey. Take it, take it, take it. Hey, hey. They was like going mad. Right. But then what they ended up doing was putting our records, I would hear my voice all over. And I'm like standing in, in bars and clubs and like, is that my voice? Mm. <laughs> and it went from that into, oh, who's that white girl singing on there? Right. Doing, all, doing all the part. Right. That's, just, that's just real, that's what happened. And so that's how you, you came into the lean on me's and all of that. But what it started with was like these guys going into Brazil, taking all these little young Brazilian girls and throwing them on records. And they was just, they just freestyling and sampling them and then coming over here and exploiting all these different young girls, myself included, because I just didn't know. I just, I just thought, oh my God, finally something that feels like me. What I listen to at home, what I know. You know, I was so just eating so hungry to hear rhythms like that. I was just like, wow. But then I caught on real quick. Again, Angela, this is that circle of us creating something, mm -hmm. it being taken or copied, and then what happens now is that the media will now name that thing. A white media is going to now name that thing and represent it and call it something different. So right. the right. same way that, that we had B-boys who did not call themselves break dancers, right? But right. then when the media comes in and right. labels it a break dancer, then the, now the B-boys are calling themselves break dancers, right? right. We, we, we see this over and over and over again to the point where you were like, okay, well, how did you take it from Soka to what you call tropical house or tropical, right. like, like how did you, because somebody at a magazine or a website named it that, or somebody said that that's not really from the scene, then it gets presented as this new thing, and that's the label that we give it. So we accept this label right. that somebody else gave it. Right. That, and then, and, and then all the artists who originated, then they got to play catch up. 
Right. right? Oh, yeah. because I'm oh, a, because no I'm a, light. Right. Or get no yeah, light or get, get no erased. Light. Or just <laughs> get completely erased out of the situation, out of the equation, because it's more comfortable for me to sell you your own culture. Right? Yeah. And the sad part is us as a people, we let people sell us our own culture. Because right. we don't educate it's, ourselves. It's physically impossible for you to, it's dangerous and physically impossible for you to come to the place to get the real and the authentic. Right. So, if, if, you know, not to say that the go-go was like the most peaceful place in the world, nah. but, it was right. peaceful, but you'd have been scared to come to the black hole. You'd have been scared right. to come like to these right. particular places right. because you're looking at, oh, I can't be here. Right. So you're not going to get the real unless you're right there. Right. So you want to get some watered down version of it. You know what I mean? The, be right. the beautiful thing, at least about go-go, is if you, water, if you water it down to the least degree, you get thrown out. Right. right. And that's that's about with right. all genres. You know right. what I mean? Right. Goku has that thing of self-correction right. and like self-preservation. Right. You'll get but, checked in a heartbeat. Yeah, you'll right. get checked. Exactly. <laughs> but but that's that's the normal cycle of you can't even come to the place. You couldn't come to the Bronx. You couldn't come to where hip hop was was happening. You you might not be able to come into the dance. You know what I mean? To hear real a real dance. You know what I mean? In Jamaica, right. you might not, it might not be physically safe for you to do that. Right. So. You, you get these re like watered down uh, presentations of what the actual thing is. Thing mm -hmm. is, right? Yeah. yeah, and then not then then playing the music, exposing it to a whole new generation, and never taking you know an ounce of time to say, hey, you know this was so and so da 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 da, and and you know this is where this comes from. Right. So you have this whole generation. That's like, yeah, it's just, you know, it's like, it's just something I've never heard. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. no, sweetie, right. you, you've heard this. Trust <laughs> right. me, you've heard this. Right, and then right. the artist, right. the artist, the <laughs> onus on the artist is to correct folks and let them know where it came from. That's what you're saying, right? And, and I yeah, think that's absolutely. what happens is instead of, they'd rather take the credit because oh, it comes along with a check, right? Mm. They'd rather take the credit for inventing something than to say, no, 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 I actually went down to such and such and listen to these DJs, the real person that I was listening to was such a set. Well, not such understanding a set. if they if they really gave, if, you know, take for instance, reggaeton and even Dimbo, right? So right, Dimbo right, right, right. Is, is, is actually from Jamaica. Right. right. Is one not, record. Right, one record, <laughs> one, right, one, one record. record. <laughs> one record, created a whole genre that is now not even attributed to the place that it came from. And yeah, we, have, we have that same thing too in our in our, in our tradition. Um, you know, I, I have research, and, and I'm real good friends with Breakbeat Lou. So mm -hmm. you know, I have done the research to say, okay, well, the, just the break culture of what we created of of going that that is really our African roots of saying, okay, I want the drum to just keep repeating and right. keep repeating, and keep repeating. Yes. But then if he digs and discovers the almond break that which is like okay well nobody even was thinking about this so then you have a whole form of music that's created you know what i mean off this one break beat right, so right, like right. That over and over and over again too just right. taking the things that we highlight and start to go to a point where you know you get to a certain year where like 60 percent of all the number ones on top billboard got a break beat in right, right. Like, mm -hmm. those things start to happen so right. we've seen this over and over and over right Right. That's a it's the, it's the That's research a segue into into hip hop, the birth of hip hop, yes. all the way to the present day. Like hip hop was created from disco records, Cool Hurt, you know, finding the breaks in the records and the b boys spitting to them, rhyming, breaking. Mm -hmm. Um, I love to tap into that with you guys to just really, really break down that from then up until modern day. Mm -hmm. Right. So I mean, if you if you go back, it was it was all forms of records. Number one, right. exactly. Uh, yeah, and 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 the first thing I, I must say, so that we can tie these things in together, because there's been there's been this thing about trying to clarify the history of certain sound systems that were playing in New York City throughout Brooklyn, throughout Queens. You know, you had people like the Disco Twins. You had mm -hmm. you had so you know uh, Cipher Sounds. You had all mm -hmm. these different sound systems right. that were coming out, mm -hmm. coming out of our tradition that came directly from Jamaica, right? right? Of people. Guru, explain the sound system. Some people may not know that. Okay, so so in our in our tradition inside of Jamaica, we have what we call sound systems, where this is actually DJ crews that are getting together, building huge speaker systems. But it was a group of people, right? Some of, some of the most famous of those is like Stone Love, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just all these crews that were together. Originally, it was put the speakers sort of the same way we do at Carnival on the truck, and we drive right. the truck through the island. Right. And that right. Was the radio station. 
right? Now, if that group of people want to play a party, they take those same big speakers, they put them up, but this is a two, three-man, four-man crew. So in our Jamaican history, the DJ is actually the person on the mic, right? right. On the mic, and the right, person, right. The person who's on the turntables is called a selector, right? Yeah. right. So right. That tradition, <laughs> yes, that tradition coming from uh, Jamaica, but transferred through people like Cool Herc, people people like uh, Bambada. That's where hip hop starts to come in. But I'm making the point that we don't want to forget the founding fathers of who Herc and Bam was looking at that right. even wanted to touch right. 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 But, right. right. We need to make a fundamental difference that the people who were playing prior to what Cool Herc and BAM was doing were sound systems playing music and the prominent music of the time was disco music. It's not to say that the disco twins didn't cut and scratch and have routines and turn around and do all of that stuff. It is the influence of the break beat that creates hip hop. That is mm -hmm. how we define it. That is the start of it. And that's why we give those founding fathers their name. So mm -hmm. when you come out with it, uh, Herc had the Herculoids and he had this big Sound right, system, right, right, that's right. But Herc would play records, but it wasn't in a fluid way. And I'm trying to be respectful to Herc. Herc would put on a record, take it off, be a little silent, hey, yeah. on one, go back. Like Herc's style was just to present the record. Africa Bambada comes, and now Africa Bambada says, I'm gonna play funky music from whatever. I don't care if it's the monkeys, I don't care if it's hey, Mickey, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind. But that drum pattern in the beginning is gonna get the crowd. What mm -hmm. Bambada started to do was figure out that there's certain breakdown parts of certain records. Normally, this is where we've gone past like the first verse or whatever, and we get into some mm -hmm. sort of like bridge part, and it would break down to the drums. And he would notice that the B-Boys, that's the time that they would love the dance floor. So he started to try to find all of those specific records, right? And now inside of that, we have other people who are adding on to the culture. We have the creation of the scratch, right? But we also have who, what, why he's the grandmaster is that grandmaster flash is who put the theory together of how to extend these and say okay well if this thing only goes for eight beats right mm -hmm. i'm going to figure out the clock of where this is so that i can put another one on this side and extend that for however long mm -hmm. i want right mm -hmm. this is also where we have technology coming in because then we have the creation of the gli fader right mm -hmm. now if you were in a disco uh uh if you were a disco dj you were turning a knob Mm -hmm. There was right. on the on the mixer. It was just mm -hmm. knob. Was mm -hmm. You could turn this one up, and, and as this is blending, you turn this one up and turn this one down at the same time. That's mm -hmm. how you mix in, in disco. So the creation of that fader uh, and, and what we call a peekaboo system, where mm -hmm. now you can listen ahead of time to what's over here, allows mm -hmm. the creation of the extension of the record. Mm -hmm. That is what creates the breaks. That is the foundation of hip-hop right. in, in the beginning. So we were searching for any type of record, but obviously in those days, James Brown is ruling. So the James Brown breaks are gonna come in, but we do have foundational records that are not even in, in black, like like Apache. Apache right. is a foundational record. It, it's a record Foundation. that was a novelty band. Yeah, like a novelty band that was just put together. People don't even know Apache wasn't even a real, the Incredible Bongo right. band wasn't even a real band. Right. right? They were just a put, <laughs> a put together band mm. covering another song. So, right. This is, I'm, I'm making this distinction in this point to say that hip hop becomes a thing that starts making us draw on our whole history. We start going through the history of all the music and go, where's all the funky parts at, right? So mm -hmm. it's not just James Brown. It becomes us going through all the soul, all mm -hmm. the jazz, all of these different things to say, okay, let's put this music together. And it's also the time-wise of the, the Bronx is burning. This is, if, if nobody could even imagine if you weren't, alive during that time, what New York City looked like with so many abandoned buildings, so many burned right. down buildings, what was yeah. going on with, with soldiers coming home from Vietnam, being high in the community, like uh, instruments getting taken away. So now this creates the, the environment for hip hop to be birthed and it was us creating something out of nothing. So now you have people who don't have instruments creating music. Right. So that, that sort of becomes the foundation of what we're built on. And then it starts to evolve from then. We have a whole culture that is surrounded it, but the music is influenced by, again, like if, if I put on a break beat and the B-boys go crazy, I, that's going to become the break. It's, it can't be too slow. It can't be too, I got to make the party move and creating a way to do that. So then we create a whole culture based off of that thing. And then eventually this DJ is going to look at his friend and he's going to go, hey, get on this microphone and tell these people how good I am. Right? So then, <laughs> 
<laughs> right. For right. sure. We have the emergence of what we call the MC in, in, in right. our culture, where the, right. all the early rhyming is the MC telling the crowd how good his how dope he is. Right. right. Oh, yep. That's it. The little shout watch, out. Wa watch what my man gonna do. Right. right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> but then so 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 but when when did it, when did it exactly change? Where because it was all about the DJ and the MC was hyping up the DJ, but then we saw a switch yes, where. Absolutely. It became more about the MC and the DJ was just in the background, but still played so, important to role. To take you through the process, what happens is if I give you the mic and I say, hey, this guy's incredible, and it's a bunch of cute girls there, I'm going to say, yeah, well, I'm kind of all right, too. And I'm going to start putting that in rhyme form. So the MC starts bigging himself up and coming up with these rhymes to talk about himself and talk about mm -hmm. how good he is. Mm -hmm. But it was also the fantasy of where I want to be. This starts to become us dreaming. Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of things that the Cold Crush Brothers was taught, they didn't have Cadillacs, right. they, they were mm -hmm. cold. Like, but mm -hmm. they're dreaming about what they want. This, mm -hmm. is, this is the, uh, you know, when we get all the way to like Big Bang Hank, and, none of what they talked about in these uh -huh. original songs, they had. They didn't have any mm -hmm. of that. They worked in a pizza mm -hmm. parlor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. But it's when we switch to now, we're putting this on record. And when we start to put this on record, the MCs start to become the forefront Right, mm -hmm. because the rhyme is out front, and the mm -hmm. DJ starts to be put into the background when we move into the selling of hip hop music. You have to remember that this was done in the park as a celebration. This was a thing mm -hmm. of respect. This was a thing of, of I'm better than you. This right. was yeah. also, This was also the first time that we see us, and I'm talking about my generation, the real value of bigging up your brother. So mm -hmm. if your brother stand or, or sister, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the women were there, right? That's right. Women crews and all of that. But if I'm standing on the corner and we both got nothing and you start rhyming and I just go, yeah, that's all right. Don't worry about that. You, I, order, I automatically sunk you right now. Mm -hmm. If I get to the point where you say that same rhyme and I go, yo, that's incredible. Yo, this guy got an incredible rhyme. Come listen to that. I just added value to your rhyme mm -hmm. by me just supporting it and bigging it up. Mm -hmm. I just added value. Now you become the guy. Now somebody's willing to pay you $250 at that time to come host the party or the DJ. Right. I just right. added value. That, that's us now validating ourselves for the first time without looking for these outside validations. Outside. Certificate mm -hmm. or a degree or it's like immediately I added value. That was the power of what came about mm -hmm. with me going through hip hop. Is I'm watching mm -hmm. my friends who had nothing. This is the, the way you make something out of nothing. Right? Well, it was it was the, it was similar to us starting our own businesses. It's similar to Black Wall Street. It's now we we have figured out something that we can sell. We have figured out something that we can go do. I don't have to have like you said. I don't have to have a GD. I don't have a, have to have a college degree. It's us making. This is I think I look at hip hop early hip hop as the creation of the creative economy. Right, yes. what people have called the creative economy. But we learned how to maximize the money that was happening. So I'm not just gonna do a park jam, I'm gonna sell a tape afterwards. Right. Give you mm -hmm. a tape so you come and hire me, right? But now I'm understanding that I could go get a box of tapes and that box of cassette tapes is gonna cost me a certain amount of money. I can dub them cassette tapes and then I can sell them to you for a certain amount of money and now I'm making money off my tapes. Right. Or I got somebody over here who can make a t-shirt, I'm gonna go make these t-shirts. I'm, I'm over here, I got this, I got that. And so the sound clash becomes also a way that we can sell. Right. right. It becomes a way that not only are you getting the concert, you're getting the merch at the concert. This is what you're going to get, you know? And, and so we start to develop our own business models. I at mean, the age of 13. Right. You know, That's what I'm saying. Right, right, right. right. The first That's time, from, the first from time from I got to negotiate a price for doing a party is like, oh, I want $100 for coming to do your party. You know, I'm right. in seventh grade. Right. But yeah. I'm, this is business. Yeah. I'm, I'm right. negotiating yeah. a price for me to come right. to a party. Like, and right. that's just to speak to your point of, of you right, creating. I didn't mean to cut you off, but creating. No, don't worry, brother. No, yeah. no, I'm just saying that's this is this is when black business. This is black business starting in a space where black business was not supposed to be, where business wasn't supposed to happen, right? And as we see the you know the 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 uh, the growth of hip hop as a as a music form, and the fact that it starts to then sell records. Yes. See, once it starts to sell records, then the commodifying of culture starts to come in. It's That's like, right. how can I get Adidas to give me a bag? 
How can I get this other people? And then the art actually, and we can't forget during that, that space and time, the New York underground art scene starts to blow up. So you got Dondi, you got, um, you know, all the graffiti artists that are coming out future 2000 that are starting to do these grand art shows. So now they end they downtown at these art shows and, and selling things that they would graffiti on a train for right. free is now going for 2000, 3000 a pop. Exactly. That, 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 exactly. That, became, that became the commercialization of everything we're doing. So it's just right. like the same way that, as he's pointing out, if an artist looks and goes, yo, this guy Basquiat that was writing on a train with us, right. now, right. now to selling pieces for this much, you're like, oh, I want to go sell a piece. So then right. if, if, if you see a Run DMC break through in 83, and you got to remember that, that not only in the 70s and prior, hip hop was in small pockets. It was it was through tapes, was reaching outside of New York City and slowly mm -hmm. getting to Jersey and slowly getting to Philly and going down to Florida. And right. then you know, all of us in the North, we're going to visit our grandparents in the South. So we're going right. to take these tapes, we're going to migrate take it out. Right. And then mm -hmm. going to migrate out West. This was no, you know, hip hop was not on the radio. It was it was all migrating through these right. tapes. So then right. we, we watch in 83 and we go, oh my God, look what Run DMC did. They just presented this thing to the world. So it's, mm -hmm. it's good for, for the people that don't know the history to understand when people say, oh, it started with Run DMC. I'm like, no, that's the group that took it to the world. There was right. a whole thing right. going on before Run DMC mm -hmm. got on the scene, but we now see the monetization and going, oh my God, you mean to tell me a hip hop record can sell a million? That was on Exactly. Right, exactly, exactly. exactly. Cause exactly. they were they were they were hugely commercialized, but they were local groups that were bigger. Casanova, right. Right. right? You know, like right, right. You know, Real talk. What what a lot of people don't know about me. Cause I never I never get to talk about this side. Um, I was really young, and I worked for this director named Lionel Martin from Classic Concepts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in the music business, when I started writing, was like, "You wait." You you from the videos and we were known for changing the way rap was looked at. So prior mm. to that, you had these videos that was kind of like in black and white, you know, really cruddy looking. And we came in and we did like all the Big Daddy Kane, like Ain't No Half Step oh, wow. and The Young Gifted and Black. And, wow. and we did um, Public Enemy, um, just a lot of videos that was groundbreaking. We did Vapors, you know, mm. uh, Roxanne Shantae, all the cold chilling from Coogee Rap to Demo to mm -hmm. all of his other songs. We did Rob Bass, Illis. And, you know, I remember just being young and being on all these video sets and going, well, you know, we did Just a Friend. That was the first time a, a rap video was in 35 millimeter. Right. And mm. just the whole way, you know, it opened. It, 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 I watched hip hop in a totally different way than a lot of kids got to experience it. I had an opportunity at a real young age to sit under a director who showed me, gave me a, a you know, once again, sharing that knowledge, a, a whole education in directing for free. He gave me basically an NYU education by sitting next to mm. him. Mm. And it didn't even realize that all this was a part of my writing because I became just a visual writer because I sat down in front of all these hip hop videos you know, which eventually moved us into the BBD videos and we did the mm -hmm. Thought It Was Me and I ended up dressing voice. And I was like watching just the evolution of where, you know, the, where the videos were before. Like just some of the rappers that we did videos for, I look back and I'm just like, wow, like tragedy, mm. you know. Um, and, and what we had to work with. And I remember just saying we, we had no budget mm -hmm. and it, everything was just so new in this mm -hmm. in, you know in this genre and you know we did the video with nwa and epmd i can't remember the name of the song or what it was mm -hmm. but merging those two together it was like when they came together it was like this is weird you know you had the i knew nothing about the west coast and then going over there seeing all that and coming back to new york with the chronic tape mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and in Brooklyn, like my house in Atlantic Avenue, everybody knew my house in Atlantic. Big would be there, Pac would be there. Mm -hmm. I was like the first house as soon as you got off the book, like the Brooklyn Bridge mm -hmm. on Atlantic mm -hmm. Avenue. So everybody mm -hmm. stopped at my house, and I remember coming home going, "Y'all gotta hear this. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard." And I mm -hmm. just remember everybody being in that room going, "What is this?" And it's you know that message 
how it how it, you know it travel how every every Friday you would listen to Red Alert and mm -hmm. you tape the show, but mm -hmm. then you go see your cousin in Philly and you be like, mm -hmm. yo, you need to check out our DJ Red Alert. Right. And he playing right. all these records that they've never heard before. It's like it's it, it it it's not the same, but it's done in such a different way today. Mm -hmm. We have the streaming, you know the. the Mm -hmm. There's no super gateway anymore. We don't have that anymore. We don't have this machine per se, mm -hmm. but we have this other machine right. that, that, that I don't know which one is more. Right. You know what I'm saying? It, it depends it, on how you use it. I, yeah. I totally get what you're right. saying. Yeah. Right. I look at the mixed how you use the mixed it. Tape. I think. Go ahead, brother. Sorry, go. No, I was no, going to say the mixed tapes of our time. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, <Dave. laughs> I, you got it. I was going to say that. Uh, through the technology that exists mm -hmm. today, we can create those communities amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just have to, uh, we have to come to that in, in YouTube and some of the independent uh, websites and podcasts that people put together. You know, that's our way of, of, uh, of communicating and sharing what's going on. So I remember back, you know, when I first got into the business, <clears throat> you could go to different states like you said, vibe of what was vibing, what was going on in D.C., Chicago, Atlanta, Miami, New York City, L.A., Seattle, you know, these different spots that own musical pulse. Mm -hmm. Now, because of the way corporate or ra music has been corporatized through radio, you know, tr uh, terrestrial radio, you don't have that anymore. Right. But you do have it if you want to listen to, you know, you want to dive deep and investigate stations such as or live what is it live uh live radio it's a little app that mm -hmm. amalgamates all of the different radio stations tune in tune in out the country yeah, tune in right tune in tune in i'm sorry tune in my bad live radio was something else live radio was independent radio stations that one could put together the precursor to podcast today mm. but um but yeah uh, tune in is an excellent source to shout in the radio stations or smaller stations in other cities to get a sense of that pulse, the musical pulse of that of that city, that community, the communities that exist in those cities. Um, that's a huge problem. Outside of that, if you want to do it on a broader scale, mm -hmm. what's yeah. that? It's a, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Not only, you know, you, you've exemplified why that's particularly happened because if we look at uh, the way that corporate has dealt with radio and we say, okay, we're going to take away all of the morning shows in each of these specific places because it's mm -hmm. cheap for us just to have the breakfast club there, then, right. you know, that's great for the breakfast club. They become the biggest syndicated radio show ever, but you also lose the local flavor. Local, right. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. Syndication, right. that key word, right, syndication. It yes. cuts out all those those other mom and pop stations yes. that, that play vital music. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and that flavor is what allowed the different expressions in hip hop because if you were being true to hip hop, you were being true to where you're from. Right. So as the as the MCs and the lyrics develop, they are we're, we're getting further into explaining who you are. Same way Angela said, you know, I knew that gangs exist, but I did not. Me being an East Coast person, did not understand the intricacy of gangs. Absolutely. And, right. And, and and being on the ground level and having it almost presented in a way that's um, just completely different from the news that's going to go, oh, these are all animals, right? Right, right, and, you know, right. And the way is explaining to me language, verbiage, code, you know, dressing, all of those things is explained through the music the same way that I can start listening to a Ghetto Boys and it's a little different than right. the South that I'm used to going to because right. I'm not going to Texas. So I'm going to get the different flavor from Texas to New Orleans to the mm -hmm. way that the accent is different, you know, mm -hmm. New Orleans, to the way that the accent is different in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Like if you, that all of that has to come through the music and, and the words that we use, but it's also happening on a bigger scale because globalization is happening all across, right. the, United right. all across the world. So, right. you no, know, those places that I frequent, you know, France, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in all those places, but I might go to Hawaii, I like Hawaii in 96. And then I went to Hawaii again to when we went out to go do Blueprint 3 because Kanye was posted out there. And I'm like, the regular strip in Hawaii looked like a regular strip in New York. Now right. it's Louis right. it's Louis Vuitton, and right. then the restaurants become KFC and the right. like globalization right. of companies just now I lose the personal flavor of what exactly right. Are. right. 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 
that exactly. thing hurts Absolutely. the music because the music right. is a reflection of who we are and our right. given circumstance. So that that thing needs to be a concentration or, you know, the, the, the biggest insult is to have people come to D.C. and say, turn that go-go music off. Right. So like that, yes. that, that, right. that sort of thing is like, what are you... We have to protect those particular things because that's Absolutely. the that's the that's the ethos of where we come from. Right, it's that erasure. I was going to say, James. That's I looked at mixtapes back then as the griots of the time. Like right. Absolutely. Particular space. Absolutely. Right. That that whenever a mixtape came out from a different space, when I was listening to uh, Magic Mike bass music that was coming out of Florida, Whoa. that was a whole different wave. And I was right. like, what is this? What is this eight oh eight? You know, the mixtapes that was coming out of Memphis, the mixtapes that was coming mm -hmm. out of L.A., the mixtapes that was definitely coming out of New York, because my grandmother lived in White Plains. So I'd be up on the weekends. So it was a South to North thing. I would go right. up on the weekends, I'm, you know, on, in the summertime and just hang out at grandma's house in White Plains and be like, all right, I'm good. And BLS tapes and KISS tapes would come back. And then I'd be at, at University of Maryland playing these new tapes. And all the dudes from New York would be like, yo, what you know about that? Right. 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 And that would just give you clout because then you were you were carrying their version of the griot with you everywhere right and right. as you moved away from that example and i and i love what, what guru said about globalization i remember being in paris in the early days the early solar days where parisian hip-hop was very what it was the ntms and the ims and solar and all of these different types of hip-hop artists that were happening in france Ver merging jazz music, merging, you know, all these different versions, and then coming back 10 years later and feeling like I was at an old Puff video, like the right. shiny suit <laughs> era Puff video. Right. I'm like, Yo, what happened? Right. Like, the thing right. that was making me happy was the fact that it was Algerian culture and Senegalese culture being mm -hmm. merged into French culture and, and Malian culture being merged into French hip hop, and then seeing these other versions of what I looked at as what a down American hip hop happening because that was what was popular at the time, right? right. So it, it, and I think what happens is, is it takes away from, from the, the original voice of the music that's there. The more that other people control the African narrative is when we start to buy it. Once again, it's sold back to them, right? So this version of hip hop that gets sold to these European kids through video and through the proliferation of companies, they start telling them, oh, we don't want to hear the Algerian thing. We don't need to hear that story. We want to hear these stories. So where is the, I need the French NWA. Mm -hmm. I need the French, you know, bad boy. I need the French mace. I need the French, instead of saying, yo, I just need booba. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. I, I don't need these other versions of you. I just need you to be you. I, I look at London. I love what London has become, the grime scene. Yes, um, right. Because it's just all, it's, it's, it's an amalgamation of African, Caribbean, and Brit culture, right? And all, they fought hard. Yo. They fought hard mm -hmm. to get here. Indeed. Right. They, I was, like, I don't know, but that music, I heard a little bit of it in, like, <clears throat> 99. I was working with a lot of, like, you know, European. I started my career in London. Mm. And I was like, what is this? We, we, what, what is this? Like the energy that they had their own dances, they had their own way, they did their own drugs, they had their own, the way they would sit in the beat. And when they get, they call me, that, 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 mm -hmm, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Every, the, their pockets were crazy. Right. And it was so, it was so intriguing to me. And like you watch that particular genre fight really hard. And after, you know, their genre being snatched commercially right. in movies, right. you know, from Snatch to all these different movies and no one knew mm -hmm. what it was. No one was mm -hmm. saying where it was coming from. Right. And then this whole dubstep come out with a whoop, 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 whoop. We know what that was. Right. And where they, you know, where they got it from, it was like a lot of white boys that were sitting in court and in the hood. Right. You know, saying, chilling in, in, in the basements of these, you know, these, these Caribbean and, and right. African right. English boys. Right. And they, there's a whole other vibe. And now here we are today, and it's interesting to see wh where we're going to go from here with that, because to emulate that mm -hmm. is, is, right. is not going to be easy. So you got to give these brothers they shine one way or the other. That's right. a big thing, Angela. And, and, and sometimes it's for a bunch of different reasons. Like, that's the great thing about the time we live in now, because you could go back on the internet and there's like videos of me in like 2010 where people are like, oh, well, what do you think the next big thing in hip hop is going to be? And I'm like, well, we kind of went all the way around the state, right. Right? North, right. Midwest, 
Got the, you know what I mean? The mm -hmm. Midwest, the North, mm -hmm. the Upper East Coast, the South, you know what I mean? The Midwest, everybody, the West, everybody got their time. So I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, it makes perfect sense that it's going to go outside of the United States. And if, mm -hmm. you, if you would have told us that this kid from Canada is going to be the one ruling, we'd have laughed right. at that. So right. what I said in 2010, I was like, yo, it's this hunger that I see in London that I don't see anywhere else because all of my guys, whether or not that's in Peck and Web, they were just like, yo, we, we, we don't. But well, how come they not listening? You know right, I mean? right. Is it the accent? Is it the this? Is it the that? And I watched them, like you said, it struck, you struck a chord with me and you're like, they was fighting so mm -hmm. hard. To even to the point where now with drill you see this cross yes yeah right right back right and forth, back and forth of drill happening over here drill happening over there but then you got some of the biggest New York drill artists now getting a beat from people overseas right the internet and all so right we start to see how it starts to influence but the place where I see it next is this I used to go to Africa and I would see in all the different places, like all these different musics that was ruling. And sometimes I could go over there and a record might be three months old in the United States. Mm -hmm, and I can mm -hmm. play a yes. and they think it's new. But now because of the internet, Nigeria is ruling Bruh. everywhere. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. So we start to have uh, people to outside of Nigeria copying that thing because they want to be the popular person on the continent. But it's just right. like, yo, the Nigerian influence to what is now a, a, a Africa with the internet is just, it's like we're going to start to see the same thing. And right. people got to make sure that they maintain where they're from and not just emulating right. something to get to the charts. Right. I'm seeing that with Senegalese Amen. hip hop. Amen. Yeah. Right. When you yeah. got dudes like Papa Sa and Kurgi yeah. um, and different groups coming out of, out of Senegal, they are killing the game. It's not a game. Senegal, Mauritania, Mali um, is, 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 is also on the wave. Ghana too. Ghana coming. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm super excited. Let me Amazing. ask the panel this. Um, we're talking about globalization. Do, do we see another uh, genre forming from this? Or we're in the midst of being, uh, is another genre evolving? Or are we on the, the forefront of a whole new thing, of a whole new vibe, a whole new manifestation, if you will, of Black music? I don't necessarily feel like it's going to be a new genre. I think it's just coming back and understanding that it's black music. Right. Real talk. Like, I think that's the thing that's emerging now. Currently, you know, we moved away and, and that goes into the urban conversation, right? We're trying to, you know, we had to use urban in order to sell ad time and ad space. Um, and now currently we're in this phase where we like, nah, we just black. We just black, it. it's black music, right? It's black music. And if it's from the diaspora, guess what? That's black music too. So let's just go ahead and call it what it is. Let's stop these differentiations between what's African and what is Panamanian and what is, right. it's, it's all black music because it's right. from the diaspora. And, and this is what we, you know, what, what we really need to adhere to. And so I think there's a respect too now, a certain respect level. I, I remember um, if, if you remember Tabby Bonet, who's who's, who's yeah. from Belize, and Wale, I remember when they first hit the hit the the fader. They had a, a dual cover on the fader, and I was like, "Yo, man, African music is about to be the wave." Right. And I was like, "It's no longer going to be when." And, and I and I thought to myself, "Man, I can't wait till Africa is popular." When when black people, you know, United States black indigenous black people, stop saying, "Oh, you African booty scratcher," and they really start looking at their own roots. Right. And understanding the roots of who they are and the history of who they are and saying, oh, my God, and just embrace Africa on a whole. And I figure when we wake up and do that as a people, then our, our dollar value and our market value and our market share is going to increase as we continue to embrace who we are. And now that Africa is popular and I say that absolutely, you know, I love the fact that Africa is popular and now it's respectable to be from, from Africa. And now people are really starting to say, I'm Nigerian, I'm Togolese, I'm Ghanaian, you know, and it's not anything that's hidden. I think that that's the next wave. The next wave is just an embrace of black music and to Google's point at the onset to get rid of pop in that way to get rid of pop as a genre. Let's stop calling it that. Let's just move on and say we doing black. You know, it is what it is. If it's black music, it's black music. And there's no disrespect in saying that. You know, I look at what Terry Crews said, you know, in terms of him saying, you know, let's black lives matter doesn't mean black lives are better. Nobody said that, right? These, these are, those are things that other people imply. 
or feel uncomfortable with when you say that Black Lives Matter. Similar to when you say Black music, there's no disrespect in calling something Black music. It's just giving you the foundations of where it came okay. from, and that's not a problem. And if you just happen to be white doing black music, it's okay for you. It's to okay too. Justin it's Bieber, okay too. who said it right, he's like, "This is my influence. It's fine to do that. Give the providence." <clears throat> you know, when you when you buy a bottle of wine, you like to know the provenance of where it came from. When you buy <laughs> a piece of art. Right, you like to get the paper, you like to get the certificate of authenticity, and on that thing, it tells you the providence of the piece. This person owned it before this person, this person owned it, it was in the museum, it was in the tape, and it was donated by such and such. It's okay to do that with black people in black music, that's fine. You can say that you got the right. influence, and that doesn't negate your greatness in what you're doing, it just means that you pay an homage to the people that helped you get where you were. Yes, I, you, right. you know, this whole what is manifesting to is the breaking down of this the segregation that they built blessing right? right so oh you 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 this is african um you know okay this is reggae um mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm. this is benchata okay um you know this is zook no this all derives from one place we, right we, we know that now right and for for years i had to hide who i was in the industry mm. i couldn't well who, like Trinidadian, like what, like mm -hmm. what is that? Like, mm -hmm. oh, what is what is that music? Or, or what is this? Or what is that? And it's like, but every chance I would get to poke that music in there, I'd poke it in. And um, you know, it, it was it was liberating for me to see that they're slowly taking away these categories because they have to, right. because it's just it's just what you said, Cole. It, it it boils down to, it is just what it is. So it is just black right. music, right? right. So. You know, I don't think, no, I didn't want that. When people ask me what I do, I was like, I, I just do music. You throw something in front of my face and whatever it is, is what it's it is. Rap. Right. It's a rap. It's a, it's a, it's a yes. rap. You I'm got definitely it. coming right. in with guns blazing. I'm right. ready. Right. <laughs> but I think, you know, <laughs> Angela, like, Angela, not to cut you off, this is, yes. this, I want you to build on this, but this is for people in a practical sense to understand that when you cut down those walls, you could be Angela Hunt and write, uh, party done and have one of the biggest records at Carnival, you know what I mean? But you can also walk into a room and write, uh, you know, New York for Jay-Z and just mm -hmm. be like, okay, I'm going to be on that vibe. And like, when you break down those walls, it, it, it takes away the definition of, well, she's a pop writer or she's an R&B right. writer. Absolutely. A soca writer. But, but they're not seeing writer. this. Yeah. This is why it's amazing that this is happening now because people don't know. They just... Like, oh, you know, then they then they try to pull us down further by inventing this word called top liner. Right. <laughs> right. Listen. Oh, you know, and how Listen. Go walking around, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a top line writer, so you know, I do everything. We're just writers. Right, and right. you know, somebody said to me about five years ago, you know, you throw all y'all in the room, y'all gonna come up with the same song. I said, excuse me. No, we won't. Because right. you know it's like in the in, in the Bible you know, that that tower where it was mm -hmm, like I, I mm -hmm. forget the story and it was tower like, Bible right right. Mm -hmm. right right everybody's gonna come out with their own thing but it's all gonna equate to the same thing right we're definitely gonna ride that beat and it's definitely gonna be hot right no matter what right so it's like I don't I don't understand like why people they constantly I, I, like it's like if they want to put this veil over you it's like well no you do this. And you do that, and I and I re, it, I remember sitting when I got my publish my first publishing deal, and it was like, so what do you want to do? I said, well, I I, I just want to do big music. Well, what's big music? I said, well, do you know that big sound of music? That stuff you see on like the Grammys, on big shows, like just big music. And it's like, well, what do you do? And I remember just being so frustrated, like, why do you keep asking me what do I do? Like, let's just do music. And he's like, well, I want to write for bands. You can't write for bands. Bands don't have writers. I was like, why not? Of course they do. For generations, bands have had writers. Right, right, right. right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, a, so you don't think Smokey Robinson wrote the song and did the music for the band? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Why? Why are you saying that that can't that can't happen? And then it's like right. all these things that they try to just segregate and segregate. It's like the segregation just doesn't stop, and it's almost still here. They're still going. Well, this is this is this type of drill and then right. you know this we got right. funky house and then we got right. this and it's like right right 
y'all realize it's the same pattern here. It's right. Like, right. When, you, when you strip it all the way down, it's coming right. from a certain. Well, it's funny. Some some executives don't know that. that that's why. That, that's why that. Well, exists. that's the problem. That's Just to throw part that of out. The problem there, is the executives. Right. Yeah. Well, well that, that, that happens. That happens based off of this one. Um, you have executives that, and I'm talking about the problem executives, right? You have mm -hmm. someone who comes to prominence for one thing 30 years ago, right? And then they right. buy it off of a reputation. So this person made great music 30 years ago and did not necessarily have to study what they're doing. They just made a hit and they, they made it to whatever right. position that they're in. And they've been, fo you know I mean? Keep going off of that position for so many years. So they're so far removed that now they're relying on the younger people inside to tell them what this thing is. And they don't research exactly what it is right mm -hmm. they're literally guessing or relying on someone else to tell mm -hmm. them what is actually good music because they're so far removed from that music or which data right. or data right or data right or data right, or data. right. It's, right. Which my it's your streams and followers yeah, right. the, the, the peter principle which is like you can move so far up in an organization that you now know nothing about what's going on at the bottom level it's sort mm -hmm. of the thing right. that i say where it's like okay you can have somebody that's a great programmer, right? They write the program that makes the company go into millions of dollars. It does not mean that they need to be the manager or have managerial skills or right. know how to run a company. Right. Or not. They just know how to write a good program. Right. right? But right. the natural way that we do business is somebody write a really good song once or is in a band or just maneuvers and they move up to this executive level and it's just like, whoa, you don't know nothing about what's going on at these bottom levels. That's how you get those executives. Right. Exactly. And they, they, ref they refuse to learn and they refuse to listen. They only listen to their kids and what's popping on TikTok, right? You know, what's trending on TikTok? Like, if it's trending on TikTok, okay. if it's, you know, if it's got the right streams, if you got a right. certain amount of followers and a blue check, then you must be somebody to listen to, right? You must be that person. <laughs> and that's not necessarily, you know, the case. And it's also case, about, no. it's also about marginalizing Black folks. Just to keep it a buck, like if if I can marginalize, if I can make you seem less than in what you're doing, then it's I don't have to worry. I don't have to that. worry about you being competitive. It's also right. Like, right. It's it's also if I say that you're a top liner, if I right. say that you only write top lines, you know that doesn't mean I'm not trying to get you from writing songs. I just don't want you to write write not the songs that I can be right. Get the exactly. back. It comes from this too. It comes from you have this ability to not change and be malleable into the times of where we are, right? right. So you were taught this way and that might've worked in 1970. It might've worked in right. 1980. It might've even worked in 1990, but we in right. 2020 now. Right. So right. there used to be times when, and, and, and sometimes people do this out of, um, like, it's almost like they do it out of love, but they just so ignorant that they don't know. Right. Take for instance, when I worked at Def Jam, we got a piece of paper that told us, this is how you roll out an album, right? right. So I'm saying, why am I applying the same marketing to Ludacris to, as I am to MOP, as I am to this? I'm like, they come Thank you. MOP they come, need to be over woo. here with the right. and be with the uh, alternative sports. Ludacris right. need to be over here with whatever funny we can get out of him. It might right. take four months to warm him up. It might take a month just to warm him. You got to think of these creative ways and get outside the box. Right. What traditional um, record labels have done, but again, mm -hmm. you get the head you may find out your job is unnecessary at this point. And right. then uh, you want that to have uh, like, what is the right. a &R really doing? My administrative a &R to me right now is way more important than the old role of the a &R that picks songs and, you know, right. brought me this and brought me that. That's the, I'm doing that on my own. I'm hitting Angela right. on my own. Like, yo, I need the right. song. Right. Like, right. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Right. Because, because the chain of command is different now. Absolutely. And if you do not know what is going on down here? What I love, one of the things I love about the you will be exposed very quickly. Um, because, Absolutely. you know, these, these kids today also, there's issues, but then they're also like, you don't even, you don't even know me. You don't Absolutely. know nothing about me. You don't know nothing about my block. You don't know nothing about, know about where I'm from. Right. You don't know nothing. And you know what? I'm out of here and I'm going to do this on my own because I don't need you. Right. We're right. also here. But there's also a vast majority of, these 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 people that come from the I don't know where they come from. They just come from all these different places and are not even willing. There was there was times a long time ago where there was ANRs that did not know what they were doing. 
Oh, absolutely. But they had something that they were willing to do, and that was learn. They were they wanted to take on this role. They wanted to learn this role. They wanted to know. They wanted to come to your house. The reason why Big John was able to hear Empire State of Mind was because he was like, well, Angela, I know you always in Europe, and you know, you always writing with the white people. What you got for me? Right. <laughs> right. What you got for me? And I'm right. like, oh, John, I don't have nothing for you. He's like, yes, you do, because you're my bridge in there because right. you know how to write this stuff play me what you got and the first record i played him was empire state of mind and he wouldn't been able that wouldn't have been able to happen if he didn't come to our home right 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 and sit there and, and break brains right. in exactly in the backyard with the rain dripping all down right. his back right and mm -hmm. all of his food and he's just like we would have never got to that record and right. none of these like that has been lost like how do you how could you verbally sit there and talk to this person and give them the best that you could give them if you don't know where they live mm -hmm. who their right. mama is mm -hmm. like right. every day just grabbing people off the internet and then not knowing or afraid, exactly or afraid that they're to crazy. Go there. that right. used to be my biggest thing when i was at def jam and i said i said to them i said yo i can't a and r from my office Right. I had the A &R job. I'm like, I got an A&R from the studio. I can't really A&R from an office because it's right. like the process of I go make a record. I got to wait until the next A&R meeting. I come in, I play it. There's 10 other people that don't make the type of music that I make, giving their opinion on the record. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of you listening to my rap record after you're about to listen to this Mariah Carey record, after you're about to listen to it. And I'm like, yo, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then right. that's like get into an office situation where somebody goes, yo, we should do a Shanti and it should be this beat and we're going to have Method Man on the beginning and Paul Wall is going to be... And I'm like, right. who the hell right. would put Paul Wall and Method Man on the same... Right. Like, it's like, it's so <laughs> right. obvious that you right. like, yeah, this is going to be like my East Coast guy. This is going to be like mm -hmm. my Southern guy because Houston mm -hmm. was big at the time. Mm -hmm. and it's an R&B record with a Shanti and we're going to get the most... I'm like, is it a good record? We just right. we're mentally talking about this. We're not right. feeling anything. Right. So exactly. Sort of what a record... Yeah, right. A and R from an office instead of A and R mm -hmm. from the studio or from field. Well, the records right. became secondary, right? right? Which I think, which I love now with the with the new wave is the records are primary. Yes. What's yes, this absolutely. record doing? What is the record? Right. What does the record sound like? How is it, it feel like? How does it, it move? Feel like you know you got to because there's so many nuances in working with folks. You got to know who beefing. You got to know who right. not beefing. Like you know, but if you're not there to listen. You know, and you also have to grant space and grant agency for people to be able to do what they do. And people to mess up. People will right. mess up. Right. right. You can't be afraid that you can't be afraid of letting people fail. I remember we I did a showcase uh you know with my old band. We were signed in Europe. We got signed to BMG France first, and then we got signed to a little label called La Belle Blue. And then when we were coming to the US, you know, we were doing well in, in Europe and we wanted to come to the US. We went to this record label, I'm not gonna say the name of the record label, but we did a showcase. All the A&Rs were there, all the label heads were there. And the reason we didn't get the deal is because they asked the person who was in a position of power, who was a black man, um, would he leverage his job basically on whether or not he thought our record was gonna sell a million copies. And he wasn't, uh -huh. he was like, nah. And as soon as he said nah, it was a wrap. It was a wrap. Right? It was like, we not, we not even gonna spend the money. We not even, we don't wanna do that. I can you only imagine that today. Like, what do your followers look like? And, yeah, you know, what do your streams look like? Right, what do your followers look like? And I'm like, yo, <laughs> I had to tell a kid. Yo, I had to tell a kid who was getting, he's getting popular now. Uh, a friend of mine, I gave my friend this record. I was like, yo, this kid is the next wave. He's a Nigerian kid. Uh, Manny Wells, actually, I just say his name. Manny Wells, he's, he's, he's a DC DMV dude. He's a DACA kid. You know, he's Nigerian. He got a serious wave. He's, he's super dope. And my friend, I gave a, a record to my friend. He walked it into to the meeting and everybody listened to it and loved the records, but they was like, ah, his followers are down. I was like, yo, what? Like, that's the, and that's what's killing records. That's, that's what's killing, killing, that's you know, killing records and killing artists. I'm sorry. That's ahead. killing the culture. Right. Straight up. It makes right. an environment where now you're worried about the side things to get your numbers up, which a right. lot of times on the internet becomes nonsense. Right. You involve right. some type of nonsense, or especially for our young female, it becomes showing your body. Right. Because that is a proven way of getting numbers. Just right. putting That's numbers. this conversation right. the other day. So right. when, when they walk into an office, they are now playing that game of knowing when they walk in, well, how many followers do you have? It's the same right. way, like, 
maybe probably about like six years ago, maybe. I was just mm -hmm. like, you know, this young kid I met through Jazzy Jeff has these incredible beats and starts playing a saxophone afterwards. And I'm like, this right. kid, Sago, is just right. like, insane. Right. Yeah. So it took this long for him to get onto the BET Awards, where it's like, no, anybody who worth their weight in whatever should have been trying to get this. He, he should be the, the, the next bidding war, is Masego. Right. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, just not, not because I looked at his followers, because I listened to the music. Right. And I, and I watched mm -hmm. and saw all these bits and pieces inside of this board where he has the hip hop, he has the jazz influence, right? He can right. play right. instruments. And when you sit down and find out, oh, he is of this new generation, because I asked him, I said, well, where'd you study? He said, mm -hmm. YouTube. Right. Huh. Right. He said, YouTube. Right. Right. I mean, the early days when I when I first ran and heard Golink, my wife had put me on to Golink's work and I was listening to it. I was like, yo, this is crazy. And I was like, who like who's he signed to? Where is he out of? And she was like, nah, he out of out of DC. I was like, nah. This kid don't even sound like he was he was rhyming, rhyming over dance beats. I was like, oh, this is dope. And then when I finally met him and saw his process when he was making at what cost, I was like, oh, he doing this whole thing. Like it was him and his crew. That was mm -hmm. it. Like literally him picking those records. He played crew for me and was like, I think this is my one. Mm. He played it to in the beginning. He knew, he instinctively knew. And I wasn't looking at followers. I wasn't doing any of that. He just asked me to be there because he heard about me from being in DC for so long. And he was like, yo, man, I just want you to pull up. And I think part of what we do as, as older folks um, or more seasoned people is we listen to in our respective positions. I believe because we were mentored well that we want to mentor kids. I don't, I don't go in trying to tell kids what to do. I go in and listen to what they want me to, you know, like how can I contribute? Or if you need my opinion, I'm not even walking in the room going, yeah, well you should do this. Or you should. I'm like, nah, nah, nah. I just want to hear what you're making. And if I, say, I'm then I, let me help you become the best you. Right. Right. Versus right. A &R from a standpoint where A&R's right. go, I need one of those. Right. And you start right. trying to fill in holes of going, well, we don't have a this and we don't have and this right. is winning and we don't have a that. Right. So they try to fill in these holes and go, let me get one of those. So right. you're going to go take a person and try to funnel them into that. Then the songs that you're going to ask Angela to write is going to go, yo, I need one of those. So right. instead of her giving her expression, she's right. been asked, uh, and without me even <laughs> knowing right. It, right, right, right. how it goes. How many times have people come to you and go, yo, I need one of those? Right. I, right. To, the point, to the point that it's, it's disrespectful. Right. It, it, just, it turns me off immediately. And there was, you know, somebody asked me, it's like, well, what? do you keep doing this for? And I was like, well, it ain't for the money. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I keep doing it because I wanted to get to a point in my career where I could do what the fuck I wanted to do. There you go. There That's you go. what I work for. That's my right. goal. So when I walk in the room and I feel like making a sauce, I'm like, well, oh, shit, I, I know you gave me this, but I'm going to do right. this over this because right. if I hadn't done those, if I hadn't walked in that studio and this white kid who's sitting there with some drums, Mm -hmm. That sound whack and didn't follow my gut and say, damn, like I can, I can see this. Is, I, and I've never really said this to anybody, but like I saw Jay on the Empire State Building with, uh, uh, I forgot his name, the jazz singer, uh, not Frank, Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. And then it was another one, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett, Tony Bennett I, got you. Imagine him and they like singing this song and I remember in the room everyone looking at me going if you don't hurry up and spit that little fire <laughs> out what you want to say right. and please stop like if I didn't follow that intuition and and went with the, we were we were actually doing like this record for Sting and it was like we're here we we're, we're in police land we're we're, we're here mm -hmm. and look how far away that is from that. And it was like, but y'all don't, and nobody heard it. Nobody saw it. And it's like, that's the whole thing. It's like, they come in the room. He's saying, it's like, oh, I want to, I want this. And could you mm -hmm. give me that? Could you give mm -hmm. me Lizzo? Mm -hmm. And I, I need, uh, <laughs> I never want them next styles, but I need it bigger. Right, and, um, right. and I'm like, and I got the artist looking at me like, right. Right. That's not what I want to do. Right. Like, right. I, so my job, you just put me up against the wall because I'm trying to, give you what you want. And mm -hmm. then I'm trying to give this young artist who's looking at me, like, help me, screaming mm -hmm. at me, right, like, help right, me. Right. And then I became a fixer. 
Mm-hmm. And you make you my job so stressful. And because now I'm sitting here and I'm like trying to help this kid out and then also feed all this information to this young artist mm-hmm. in a, in in three hours or so. Mm-hmm. I'm like, don't you just you just gotta find a way to do what you're doing and get it in there. Right, right. And you, you you can do what they want you to do, but you gotta find a way to just go around it and mm-hmm. you know that needed to stack has to stop because Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of people that are willing to take that leap and say well sure i know you wanted you know this 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 drake record but um there is a drake right (laughs) right and his records are already out right right and they're doing well and i like them right and here's what i would like to do if you just stop and let somebody do something you don't know what that person can manifest Right. right right And so, you know, and it, it's what caused me to say, well, all right, well, I don't know where this genre belongs that I keep hearing in my head, but I'm going to just put these records out. Right. I'm not looking for anything. I'm not looking right. for, you know, people to say, oh, you know, do whatever. I didn't want to be another writer turned artist. I wasn't trying to do that. Mm-hmm. I was just sitting on about freaking 2,000 records that had instruments and sounds from all over the world. And I felt like, well, there is somebody out here that just wants to hear culture. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, and that's the case today. You always be number two when you chase what's number one. Right. And that's right. another statement that I make to, right. to my students where I'm just like, yo, if you, if somebody, again, the example you use, if, they, if you look and say, okay, I need a Drake record. Well, Drake's going to be the best at doing Drake records. Mm-hmm. So then right. you're always going to be number two right underneath right. the ear. Right. So it's just like, you know, like, I don't know if, if, if you could have said, what the Britney Howard album was going to be before she made right. it, right? But it's just like, okay, here's a girl. And is that country? Is that down right. home? Is that right. soul? Is that No, right. it's Britney Howard, who right. is a biracial gay woman from Alabama. So it's going to have a little bit of country in country. Right. Yes. it's soul. It's going to have, but right. It's going to be written from her perspective. Perspective, of, right. You know, why, why did, who, who threw, the, who threw the, you know, the horse head in the back of my, in my, my right. dad's car? That's right. not going to happen in the North. That's going to happen in the South. So it's like, let this person express who they are and nobody right. else could have wrote them songs but her. And right. it's different than my expression when I'm in Alabama shape. So it's just like, right. it's the time it gotta be what your own personal expression is. My son's hip hop is gonna be different because right. I want him to write about what it feels to be 16 years old right now in 2020 right. Right. in the United States. I never went to school, high school with the internet and with phones. Right. Without, right. I, right. I don't have no we, know, we don't even know. We don't even know what that is because right. right when we got to the point of rap being at that place, they muted us. Right. They muted Public Enemy. You know, right. they, they, right. they muted Dead Presence. All, like we, we were going there. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we were there we with Bada and all of them, and then and then we came back around. Right. You know, we had the NWA, we had all, we had all, and then it was just like okay, and then we came, we got commercialized, we got the shiny suits came in. Right. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, yeah, a lot well, of what, that well, what we had because of the politics of of the country at the time. Right. But that's but a, also, that's a whole another conversation. Right. Because that the whole tide of hip hop, the change in the tide of hip hop from the late eighties to uh, mid 90s when we were very political yeah. and uh and yes uh, you know there was a strong energy of solidarity mm-hmm. I, I personally think that the uh between nwa and pe's fight the power especially that video that spike shot scared the shit out of america mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh you know the, the tide very quickly changed once you had presidents writing to record labels to stop uh uh, yeah. Recording artists from from creating and, kind of music that yeah. they're creating. <laughs> mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you saw a, a strange shift in uh, the type of music that was being released with a hip hop tag on it, and the kind mm-hmm. of artists that started rising to the top. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's instead a, there's of, a uh, instead there's of the theory. culture or the conscious, I'm sorry, Guru. No, I was no, just no, saying, instead of the instead of the conscious and politically uh, uh, oriented songs, you started seeing more of the sing song. Heavier, heavier emphasis on profanity in a non-essential, uh, not essential way. Mm-hmm. You know, profanity was used to emphasize a point in those early records. Then, uh, when you got the comical hip hop, I'll, I'll just call it comical. Um, it became, uh, you know, utilized as a tool, primarily for kids that wanted to rebel because those, the most of those records had parental advisory stickers on them because of the language. 
Mm -hmm. you know. So let's put that on there, market it. Kids are always going to gravitate to what their parents don't want them to have. Mm -hmm. And then you saw more of a, a proliferation of those records starting to rise to the top because it not only was there were more money spent to promote those and less on the political activists, if you will. Um, that, there's there's that, also that the thing, became, Tommen, man. Tommen, if you think about right. Tommen and how this relates to us, to right. where, again, I use that word zeitgeist, right? If you look at 87, 88 with, with uh, let's say, you know, from the gods being on the corner building with us every day, to what was going on in terms of people walking around just wearing African medallions. African right. Pride was, right, was right, right, right. The late, the late 80s is where we start to see black people in this country take on Kwanzaa as a real right. celebration. Right. You know, yeah. 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 Kwanzaa started then, but I'm talking about when it became popular. Yes. Right, yes. Right, 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 popular. no doubt. Yes, yes. right, right, right. 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 All, of this, all of this started coming in. So the same thing that happens when they say, well, what happened to the movement? And we, and we talk about like civil rights, but they were like, well, black people got jobs. You know, my, my, my parents, <laughs> there you go. Tell it. Was that first yeah. generation that now, okay, if our thing is to break through this glass ceiling and now right. my dad becomes like that generation, oh, I'm the first generation to go to college. Now we done right. broke through the glass ceiling. Now, if I'm sitting in this job now where I'm making a buck fifty a year as a black man, I'm like, well, I ain't I ain't as angry no more. Now my family <laughs> starting to get right. money and that that's what happened to us when the money came into hip hop. Now that right. we started to make money and we see these shiny suits and the Roly became the biggest thing. It's like, mm -hmm, oh, like mm -hmm. that now I'm going to move towards that. And, and we started to live a little bit of a more comfortable life. So mm -hmm. it's like, yo, the anger starts to leave, but you need right. these times now. You, right. need, you need to be angry to be free. You don't get yeah. freedom unless you're angry. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. we need these times now to back where us as a collective, and it's easy for our youth to understand that mm -hmm. the times that we're in now. So it's like us being mad as a collective and what are right. we going to do about it? You're going to see the music start to return as mm -hmm. we have. See the music start to return to that focus of speaking to particular issues. I haven't heard any of the, any of the stupid records, you know what I'm saying? Or mm -hmm. right. even 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 certain artists that may have been in a vein of like, okay, I'm just doing this. We see Baby come and and, and he got a mm -hmm. number one record mm -hmm. talking about right. what's going on. So it's like right. immediately the youth is responding. Right. Well, I think right. this it goes it goes to that same point. Is there were no? I mean, we think about. Public Enemy and and Poor Righteous Teachers and all of these other groups as uh -oh. these conscious uh -oh. right as these conscious groups actually they was just telling a story right, right. Yep. they weren't even label conscious what what the difference was is at that time there was a diversity in what we listened to or what we're programmed mm -hmm. to listen to so you could hear N.W.A. you know um, uh, De La Soul Poor Righteous Teachers Queen Latifah on the span of one radio station. So you're going to hear these different sides of hip hop, these different stories. And what happened is it shifted to one story. Those other artists never disappeared. They kept right. making records. They kept talking about message. There's been message records that 87, 97, 2007, 2017, all these people, there are people that have still been making some of those same records still having some of that same content, we just weren't focused on them. They weren't the ones that were pushed into the forefront. So I look at the music now, and nobody from that generation told kids that this is, it's okay to talk about this. Yes. That you can get a Roly and you can get a Bentley, and you can get this from even just having your own message. And I right. think when you have Lil Baby coming out with a record like this, and he's like, oh, hold up. So you mean I don't have to talk about that? Right, this right. too, and it's all yes, right. it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. So that's what I'm saying. It's a, it's an embrace of who we are. If it's all right to, to be, say, African, that's not to say little baby can't go back and turn. No, up. he can do whatever he want. He do turn up, but let's right. let's recognize that the turn up is three hours out of my week. I'm right, be, uh, right. Three hours. Out. What am I doing? What's your experience the whole rest of your right. life? Right, but that's right. right. But it, exactly. but but there exactly. has to be space and agency given yeah, for right. those with different messages right. to be able to have the right. same space and same platform to speak on, and that's right. the issue. The issue wasn't that we didn't have messages. It's just that wasn't put on the platform. Like, that right. wasn't a lot, that too came from, a lot of that too came from not only was the messaging made a certain way, right. the format was made a certain right. way. Right? Right. So right. When Puff come in and Puff has his formula, 
that became the de facto formula right. for what a hip hop record is supposed to be. It became right. eight bar intro, 16 bar rhyme, eight bar chorus, right. 16 bar, you right. might have a bridge or you right. might have the next verse, right? right? And, and right. our kids don't even get the third verses no more, right? That's no, just, no. Right. Right. Records, <laughs> records are not, you don't have a 445 record no more. Right. Right. You got right. a 222 right. record. 222, and if, there's no and if, <laughs> and if the record ain't 222, you feeling like that thing mad long. Like right. listening to listening to an old, uh, uh, old P-Funk record and that joint playing for eight minutes, you like, good God. When Kamasi <laughs> came out with the 12 minute song again, you like, good God, like, what is that? He got nine million EPs on this one song. Like, but we used we had, to, we, we, we watched the format made, short enough. We had hip hop records that were made in all types of formats. You know right. what I'm saying? So, right. So it's, it's Ice Cube just starting, give me that beat, fool. And yeah. Right. Intro, intro, warm up. It's, it's nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. Right. He wasn't, he wasn't singing no chorus. He was just like, Jack, well, no. the beast is mine. Right. You might not recognize it, but Microphone Fiend is all one verse. There's no one. chorus, there's no Nothing. microphone. Zero. Fiend. Amen. Zero. Zero. So it's Zero. just like, your expression got to be free. There's no, you can't trap yourself into these things of like, yo, the hit record formula. Right. Eight bars, 16. Eight. Right. You can do right. whatever you want. Yeah. But, but then but again, they, they start that, that category, that, you know, categorizing. Right, right. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, well, this backpack. And then, you don't know, you, you, right. you, you ain't cool if you listen right. to that backpack. You underground. Right. You underground, right. underground right. and you right. backpack. Right. And it's like, yo, but backpack and underground was overground and popular That's right. for a time. Right. Until it was made, until it was programmed to be background music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Until it was programmed. programmed everything of it. The right. dressing of it. Right. 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 You know what I'm right. saying? So, right. you know. You had the ones that was listening to deep, deep inside with the paisley shirts, right, and then right. you know, and then you had the guys that was listening to most F and Talib and right. and Pharaoh, right. and you know, it's like, oh, you going to that show? Right. Oh, right. okay. Yeah. Well, I'm you know, I'm going over here to da 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 da. Right. You going to the instant head rap show? <laughs> <laughs> hey everyone, uh, this, I, oh I think we we running we running. We ran over our time, but this was a okay. great, great discussion. This was so great. Great. We can, this was great. We can yeah. take this to IG another day or another Zoom. Like everybody was definitely very informative. Um, I learned a lot. I'm sure the audience learned a lot. Um, I did. Thank, thank yeah, you. Likewise. Same. For sure, for sure. Or, thank you. From the bottom of our hearts. Enjoyed um, this. Shouts out to the CSAC crew. Um, everyone Shout out, out there. Jay. Oh, yeah, 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 brother. Yeah, yeah, take you well, brother. Angela, you guys, you young guys. guru, Coke, thank you so very, very much. Thank y'all for having Brothers, me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, you know, being Indeed. here, being a woman. I truly appreciate it. Thank you for rapping, and, um, for sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's for mine. Everything that you do, everything that you've contributed to to our, our world, our experience. Thank Appreciate you so much. It. I just also just want these girls to know, like, yo, you could twerk and you could do all that, but I got a female engineer, female all studio. Like, there's other things out here than being in front of this camera. Right. And, like, they just need to know that there's, there's female lawyers, there's female A and R's. Right. You know, they're they're out there for them to get, and I just think they need to be told that a lot more. We got mm -hmm. Meg the Stallings, we got Nikki's, we got all these girls already. We need other things other than That's that. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. That's right. So. This is so informative, and you know, it's I learned so much, and that means somebody out there learned something else today, mm -hmm. too. So, you know, and thank you guys for being such great role models to just so many people out there. Thank you for being here, Angela. I thank you, it. Angela, for sure. Appreciate you, appreciate you. I need some music, yo. Yeah, I'm about to connect. I'm, 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 I'm like this already. I'm about to be like, Mike empty. I'm like, come on. I'm about, to, I'm about to pull up in your DMs real hard. Like, hey, you ain't got nothing else to do right now. I got, <laughs> packs. Right. I got packs. I got packs. I'm going to you know, <laughs> As they say, send me that beat back. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, listen, thank you again. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy. God bless everyone. And uh, I guess we're going to be out. Peace, brother. All right. Peace. Peace, God bless. Take care. All right. Bye bye now. Bless you.